चलो मैडम सुरू हेलो एंड गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन On behalf of Pune uh, IIP, of uh, new team of Pune IIP 2022, I welcome you all uh, for today's CME about updates on special census. Acha karyakram ata shubharamba apan Saraswati samanani karuya. शीतल आवाज शीतल आवाज ये नहीं है एक मिनट नहीं शीतल शीतल पांच मिनट नुस्त चालू है नहीं ये अजु दुसर लावून बघा
म्यूट आहे मॅडम तुम्ही म्यूट आहे म्यूट आहे now i invite our president uh, dr parag gaikwad to say a few words thank you madgiri gur ma'am uh, good morning all <coughs> welcome all for this first cme by iip new team 2022 we will have stalwarts from ent and ophthalmology for today's webinar hopefully we will have in person cme in next month uh, then our next uh, uh, first e bulletin will be released in this week this bulletin will be on the mental and physical fitness uh, so thank you over to you mudgirika ma'am for further proceeding uh, today our first uh, topic is tearful tiny tots uh, by dr ramesh murthy uh, dr ramesh murthy uh, is a cataract surgeon he is also squint surgeon and children eye, children's eye specialist and oculoplasty surgeon he has 123 publications and he has uh, international presentations in 21 countries he has received 37 awards he is review, reviewer of many archives american journals british journal etc he is a teaching faculty at orbis international flying eye hospital he is a senior editor pediatric ophthalmology indian journal of ophthalmology editor poster pune ophthalmological society journal over to dr ramesh murthy sir Uh, thank you madam for your kind introduction uh, can you hear me madam yes sir okay sir can i share my screen yeah yeah sir other person has to stop the screen share sir somebody is sharing screen already ha huh. yes. hello no, sir now you can share sir Sir, is it visible yes but uh, not started is showing uh, browsing logo hmm started sir okay sir so i'll put full screen yes So I'm putting full screen. Once it comes to full screen, please let me know. Not yet. Yeah, it's now. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, continue, sir. Sir, uh, uh, this is a uh, overview of all the pediatric lacrimal problems that we face. Uh, uh, my request is that uh, if there is, a, I get become very technical, you can stop me, or you can even ask me any time, anything. any thing you want you can ask me so we can discuss freely and clear all our doubts and we can also understand from your perspective so pediatric lacrimal problems includes many different problems so any whenever in child comes is a very small child like it could be infant less than 1 year old who comes we have to evaluate the child properly so we have to realize that children have a different anatomy different structure as compared to adults and the problems are unique to them <clears throat> so we could have two kinds of problems one is true epiphora true epiphora means there is a blockage in the tear secretion and therefore watering is coming out problems could be from the punctum canaliculus sac or the nasolacrimal duct and the other fact is pseudo epiphora which means there is no problem in the lacrimal system but patient is having either dry eyes or the lashes are rubbing the eyes or patient's eyes not closing because of facial opacity or there is foreign body or allergy or there is uh, any kind of conjunctivitis So when you evaluate, we always ask the history since when it started. What are the symptoms? What is the severity? Examination under good elimination is a must. We use magnification if possible, like use a loop or uh, lenses. And if required, we also use sedation or anesthesia. We look for crusting and redness, lid malposition, facial abnormalities, medial canthal swelling, whether it is above or below the medial canthal tendon and eyelids and ocular surface. So let us first talk about the puncta. So the puncta are the tiny openings which are present in the medial aspect of the forehead and the eyes. Uh, want, uh, mm. whether it is the position is correct whether it is touching the eyeball whether it is actually developed or not we also would like to look at the canaliculus by probing or we can also look at the sac 
So uh, we always try to press over the sac region and see if there is any fluid coming out, regurgitation, which indicates that there is a congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. If required, we can also do diagnostic probing and, and syringing, and this is also therapeutic. Intranasal examination with an endoscope and imaging in special situations. So one of the easiest tests that we do is the fluorescein eye dis dye disappearance test, where we put just fluorescein into the fornices in a child, and ideally it should disappear within three to five minutes. So this is a very easy test which we can do to understand if the lacrimal system is working in a small child if you don't want to do any major test. Now special tests I just mentioned briefly, contrast dichrocystography, we use dyes and we look at the, uh, the passage of the dye through the different uh, uh, passages that is from the canaliculus and then through the sac. Uh, I'm using a laser pointer here. So through the canaliculus and then through the sac and then through the nasorectal duct. But here you can see there is no passage. So there is a block here. Lacrimal scintillography. We use Echnetium 99 drops. This is done in Pune also, where we can use a gamma camera to see how the dye is moving. It's a radioactive isotope. So we can see it moving through the canaliculus. CT DCG we can do routinely in uh, any good setup. And uh, we look at the uh, position. This is a dacrocystography using CT scan. We can also do MR dacrocystography, which is the most advanced method of uh, looking at the lacrimal system by using gadopentylate dye. Endoscopy is very useful because actually you're using lo looking inside. So we use a pediatric endoscope, usually 2.7 millimeters. We can use zero degrees, which is very commonly used. And if required, we can use 30 and 60 degrees. Now let us look at some common problems that we encounter, like a congenital lacrimal fistula. So this is a congenital lacrimal fistula. It is a rare anomaly. It connects the sac to the skin, usually asymptomatic. And you will see one small spot from where water is coming out as a small dimple inferior nasal to the medial canthus. If it is acquired, usually there will be scarring. A very interesting thing about the congenital lacrimal fistula is if you pass three probes, one through the fistula, one through the lower punctum, one through the upper punctum, they will all meet. So this is a three-point test. This is a very interesting finding of a congenital fistula, but in acquired, it may not meet. And the location is always typical in a congenital fistula. It is about two millimeters inferior and medial to the punctum. And the skin surrounding is normal. How do we manage? We go ahead and we see if the nasolacrimal duct is patent. If it is patent, then we just go and do a fistulectomy. If it is not patent, then we definitely will go for a DCR surgery. So this is a, uh, you can see very clearly, I've used a blue dye to highlight the fistula. We're just taking an incision around it and we excise it down deep up to the lacrimal sac. And then we suture the sac wall and the orbicularis and the skin. Another interesting condition is you may have come across in uh, newborns is congenital dacrocystose, a bluish medial canthus cyst with watering, usually more common in females. And this can, the problem is that it can cause airway obstruction because it can extend into the nose. So this is a very interesting finding, which you will see. So it generally extends from the uh, lacrimal system to the inferior meatus. Diagnosis can be done prenatally by ultrasonography, or we can do a dacrocystogram, but clinical diagnosis is very easy. Uh, we can do MRI, which will show a T1 low signal and T2 high signal. So the problem is that it not only is obstructing the lacrimal system, it can also obstructing the nose, in which case there could be breathing problems. So sometimes it becomes an emergency. And other differential diagnosis for this would be capillary hemangioma, encephalocele, or dermoid cyst. Dermoid cyst being a very firm structure, encephalocele, it, has, it will have pulsations. And capillary hemangioma, when you press, the blood will go. When you release, the blood will come inside. So this is capillary hemangioma, which you can see clearly. And this is an encephalocele. And this is a dermoid cyst. So in a, a dacrocystosil, we can observe it as small, but if you feel that there is any problem, then definitely we can go ahead with probing because probing will immediately relieve it. So massage or probing is usually helpful in these cases. So early surgical intervention is definitely uh, indicated when there is a respiratory difficulty or there is infection. And we can always do a syringing and cause a blowout of the sac of this dacrocystosil inside the nasal cavity. If required, we can always go with an endoscope and do a resection of the cyst and stenting and other things. Now, briefly, we'll talk about some interesting punctal and canalicular anomalies. So sometimes punctum will not develop at all. The membrane is there and is not opening at all. Or the punctum is not developed at all. Or there could be more than one puncta which could be present. But the interesting thing is most of these punctal anomalies will also have canalicular problems because they, they usually come together from the ectoderm. 
So what we look for is the absence of the papilla. The papilla is a raised structure near the punctal opening. So it is like a small hill. If there is no papilla, then it means that canaliculus is also not developed. But if the papilla is present, there is a good chance that the canaliculus is there, but the punctum may not have developed. So this is the region of the papilla. This is the papilla, which you can see here. This is the papilla. This is the punctal region. So we can do a cut down. We just generally try to cut down and see if we can explore and see if we can open it under a microscope. And if it is open, then definitely we put an intubation tube inside. Any kind of tube we can put. So this is a rectangular three snip punctoplasty that we do for these cases and go inside and we open it up and put a stent inside. Now, canalicular obstruction is the most difficult problem to treat because it could be different locations like proximal, uh, mid or distal location. And uh, the problem is that usually it is, it is a very blind surgery because there's no way of diagnosing where the block is and how to treat it. Different methods we have tried like uh, retrograde DCR, which is a dacryl to rhinostomy and we put an intubation tube, which you can see here, putting a tube from inside. So different ways we can do it or we can do a trans endoscopy. Now this we, machines we don't have uh, available because it's extremely expensive, but we can load, go through the canalicus with an endoscope. What we can do is the canalicular trephination and uh, followed by intubation. Even laser surgery can be done and we can open it up. So congenital dacryocystitis is the most common problem that we face where there is watering from the eyes and it is because there is a blockage at the distal end of the nasolacrimal duct. So there is failure of canalization of the nasolacrimal duct at the region of the valve of Hasner. So incidence is as high as 30% in term babies, but symptomatic block will occur in only 2 to 6% usually onset after three weeks of age, and most of the cases are going to resolve spontaneously. How does the child present? Child presents with watering and discharge, chronic conjunctivitis, matting of the lashes, and when you press over the sac region, there's regurgitation of the discharge. How do you treat these cases? We do a sac massage. We take a swab for culture sensitivity, use antibiotics. 90% of the cases are going to resolve in these cases. Common organisms include hemophilus influenzae, staph aureus, pneumococcus, and beta hemolytic streptococcus. And most commonly, it is the pneumococcus or the hemophilus, which is a cause for this. There are variations we can see. Now, what we do in these cases? So when is the ideal time to treat the case? So initially, we have given conservative management of massage for maybe a year or so. But at the age of one year, the chance that it is going to spontaneously resolve is about 0%. We can see here in this particular chart. So at the age of one month, the chance it's going to spontaneously open up is about 96%. So probing is done when there is failure of over three months of conservative management or the child is about one year of age or just above one year of age. In older children, the success will decline and you may, there is a chance that there is a complex obstruction. So what is a complex obstruction? Complex obstruction means there is a bony obstruction. Nevertheless, in any ch older child who presents with this problem, we always do a trial of probing to see if we can avoid a surgery like a DCR. So probing has to be done early if there is a cataract. And you want to do a cataract surgery because we can't have a discharge and a pus near the eye when we're doing cataract surgery. Or if there's an extremely symptomatic child or even extremely symptomatic parents also, a repeated episodes of acute dacrocystitis and a dacrocystose scene. So generally we do it under a general anesthesia only and have a cuffed endotracheal tube so nothing will go into the lungs. We use decongestant spray and we use different kinds of probes to do the probing. So we can probe it in the office or in the operating room. We always prefer to do it in the operating room, unlike in the United States where many people like to do it in their clinics. So in probing, what we have done is we are trying to open up or dilate the punctum. Once you dilate it, then we pass this probe first vertically and then horizontally till we hit the bone here. And then we gently go in the direction of the nasolacrimal duct and we just push it across and it will open up. So how do we know that the probe position is confirmed? It is flat on the forehead. It is aligned with the trochlea. And we can also pass a metal through the nose here and we can feel the probe. We can do an nasal endoscopy, we can see it. And once it is patent, how do we know it is patent? We do a syringing and we do a nasal suction. And this we can tell us that the probing has been successful. Sometimes probing is difficult because we are not correcting the diagnosis. There is a canalicular block or a soft tissue block, or we've gone in wrong direction, false passage, now, there is a very tight bony obstruction 
in which case we can even uh, break the inferior turbinate and allow the nasal duct to open we also try to use sometimes graduated probing that means smaller size probings first and then larger size probe and then try to move it in a, a circular fashion to open up the nasorectomal duct so suppose probing has failed then what do we do then we can always repeat it after 6 weeks if we feel that it is likely to succeed we can put a tube inside so that it will not close again all these patients post operatively receive nasal decongestants antibiotics we ask them to continue the sac massage only if two probings fail only then we should consider other measures so probing as you can see in the first year of age the resolution is as high as 90% success but at the age of 5 years the chance of probing being successful only 40%. So at the age of one year, if the patient is not resolving, it is best to refer to the ophthalmologist so that they can do the probing. Alternative treatment is infracture of the inferior turbid. So the nasolacrimal duct actually opens under the inferior turbid, as you can see here. And once you break it in the inferior turbid, then the fluid can pass very easily and it will increase the success of the probing. You can also pass a tube through this, directly pass a tube, and this is uh, the retriever. You can see it is having a, like a hook. So we can pull this particular olive tip and this is called as a Crawford stenting. So stenting can be done to increase the success rate. People have also used balloon catheters to open up the uh, nasorecumal duct. We don't do it routinely. Now, if, if nothing has happened and it has failed probing and then the patient has to go for a surgery, which is a pediatric dacrocystorhinostomy. So important thing here to understand is that child is having less blood in the body so we should be very careful about the blood loss when you do this surgery because the nose and eyes region is extremely vascular also we should do very carefully and we should not damage any of the uh, structures you should not go very superiorly towards the cribriform plate again in all these cases we use a stent so that the success is high so here you can see the steps of surgery a small skin incision opening up the orbicularis going inside this is the Middle palpebral ligament. Once we elevate the middle palpebral ligament, we can see the lacrimal fossa. This is the region of the lacrimal sac. We make a bony ostium opening in the lateral wall uh, in the ethmoid region and the maxillary bone. So here you can see the nasal mucosa. We make a flap in the nasal mucosa and we suture a flap of the lacrimal sac to this nasal mucosa. We can see here we made the flap of the nasal mucosa and this is the sac flap. So these two are sutured together with uh, absorbable sutures after putting a stent inside. This is the stent. And then we suture these two flaps and then we suture the orbicularis and the skin. And this is the stent which is tied and left inside. And this outside is sutured clean. Endoscope is uh, very useful for us and we routinely look inside the nose using endoscopes to see uh, how the probing has succeeded and whether we can see the probe inside, whether there are any additional problems inside the nose. This is the interior of the nose as we see through the endoscope and uh, this is the region of the lacrimal sac here and the uh, nasal duct will open much further down. So in summary, uh, the congenital nasal lacrimal duct obstruction which, we saw, which you commonly see in your practice is the easiest obstruction to treat. Early intervention is useful. Most cases will resolve with uh, the use of massage and conservative management because it is anyway naturally going to resolve. And it is very important that we create awareness amongst pediatricians that at the age of one year, it is best to go ahead uh, with probing so that we can avoid surgery like dacrocystorhinostomy. Two words about pediatric lacrimal trauma. Thank you, sir. I'm just finishing two words about lacrimal trauma, very important topic. So what happens is many times we have pediatric lacrimal trauma because of blouse hook injury. So the blouse hook or any small structure will hold the middle, uh, middle region and it will just pull it across because this is the weakest part of the eyelid. And because of this, the canalicus will tear. So it is important that we treat these cases early because if we delay more than three days, then it is unlikely that we'll be able to find out where the canaliculus is. It's again very easy under the microscope. We can do it very easily and very fast surgery it is. And here we're putting a stent inside. This is called as a monocanalicular stent, also called as a mini monoca stent, which we use to clear this. So in conclusion, lacrimal disorders assume myriad manifestations in children. CNLDO or congenital nasal lacrimal duct obstruction is the commonest problem and successful management is possible in these cases. And um, we are always thankful to the pediatricians who refer the cases on time to us so we can treat them properly. Thank you very much. I will stop my screen share and we can have any questions or whatever.
thank you, sir. That was a wonderful uh, uh, lecture. Uh, there is one question from Dr. Dharap. Uh, can you tell us the proper technique uh, for eye massage? Uh, the uh, two eyelids are joined together at the medial canthus and between the eyeball and the nose uh, in the lacrimal fossa is the lacrimal sac. So the purpose of uh, this uh, massage, which is named after Krigler, or a, it is a hydrostatic massage. So basically, we're trying to push all the contents of the sac downwards towards the region of the opening of the nasolacrimal duct, where usually there is a membranous obstruction. So when you press it down, it will open up. So the massage has to be done from the top downwards between the eyeball and the nose. Uh, along the curvature of the orbit. So gently you can push down and with firm massage, neither pressing on the nose, neither pressing on the eye and you're trying to push all the contents downwards. So that is the technique of the hydrostatic massage that we advise for the patients and usually it's successful. Many times if you do it forcefully in a very young child in the clinic itself, it will open up. You can feel a pop sound and it will open up. Many times it happens. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we will. Uh, any other questions? Anybody is having any questions? Okay, we will move on to panel discussion. Uh, uh, the moderator is Dr. Shushruta Deshmukh. Uh, she is a consultant pediatrician uh, at Kulkarni Children's of Clinic at Somar Clinic. She is also IIP uh, secretary at present. Over to Dr. Shushruta. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Okay, so now uh, we move ahead to the panel discussion. We have eminent, we have practice calls today in the panel discussion. Uh, can I request Dr. Mudgirikar, madam, to just uh, stop screen sharing? Okay, okay. Yeah, so today we have practice calls and uh, we have eminent faculty today on board. We have Dr. Ramesh Murthy, we have Dr. Zai Kekar, and we have Dr. Prasad Vaidhi here. So, uh, with, without much ado, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Ramesh Murthy. Just uh, give me a moment. Yeah, so Dr. Ramesh Murthy, as, as already introduced, is a cataract surgeon, as a squint surgeon at Children's Eye Hospital and Oculoplasty Surgeon, as a, and has multiple publications to his credit. He's a teaching faculty at Orbis International Flying Eye Hospital and a senior editor of multiple journals. And he has many awards to his credit. The second panelist today is Dr. Zai Kekar. Uh, Dr. Zai Kekar is editor for Pediatric Ophthal for IJO. She's a reviewer of few, few peer reviewed journals and has 34 publications to her credit. And her other hobbies are she's interested in painting as well as she's an avid marathon runner. The next speaker for the session, the next panelist is Dr. Prasad Varimbe. Dr. Varimbe is a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist and strabismologist at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital, Jangir, and also runs his private hospital in Maharashtra. He's edited a, and written a book titled Step by Step Squint Surgery and has actively participated in multiple natu national, international, and ophthalmology conferences and invited faculty. Okay, so today's basically is going to be more of an interactive session. The first topic which we commonly encounter is a red eye. Is, uh, so uh, the, this question would be directed to Dr. Ramesh Murthy. So as we commonly encounter, a child is brought in the morning OPD by his parents saying that he has got a red eye. So can you give us an approach of what we as pediatricians should be looking at? What should we consider as a differential diagnosis and what could be the causes? But when a child comes to us with the red eye, then uh, there could be multiple causes for that. 
So uh, the first thing is we have to make sure that there is nothing serious uh, in this case. Uh, most of the times it is usually a uh, allergic conjunctivitis, which is a commonest problem. And then other problems could be acute viral conjunctivitis. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah. Yes. So I'm just putting up the slide so you can just describe. Uh... Hello. I'm sorry, but yeah. So, uh, so if you look at this particular child, a child has uh, having acute viral conjunctivitis. So the classic feature here is there is presence of discharge, classic discharge from the eyes. There is severe lit edema, and the eye will also become extremely red. The white of the eye becomes extremely red. Patient may have other problems also. <laughs> like lymphadenopathy. So this is a very classic feature of acute viral conjunctivitis. So in these cases, you have to be very careful because it's likely to spread very fast to other children in the school, to the entire community, to the parents, and even to the doctors. In contrast, if you see allergic conjunctivitis, it's a slightly different picture. But we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So Shurata, ma'am, uh, start slideshow. Just a minute. Yeah, so is this slide okay? Or should I go to the previous one? Second, second slide, Raji. Second slide. Just See. go up and up. The second slide in your presentation, madam. Yeah, this was my second slide. This is fourth slide, madam. We'll go to second slide. Yeah, this is slide number two in my presentation. Yes. Just line number two. Okay, madam. It doesn't matter. So, uh, so the difference between uh, this allergic conjunctivitis and this viral conjunctivitis is that in allergic conjunctivitis, the predominant problem is the itching of the eyes. And there could be some amount of redness around the limbus. When we evert the lid, we'll see the small papillae. And there is no preauricular lymphadenopathy. But if you have acute viral conjunctivitis, it's very highly likely that you'll have preauricular lymphadenopathy. The submandibular and the preauricular nodes may be enlarged. Severe lid edema is a feature and severe discharge. So the first question is, is the child seeing well? If the child is seeing well and there is no other problem, it's going to be self-limiting. We advise antibiotic drops to prevent secondary bacterial infection and lubricants for comfort and child will do well. But if the vision is getting affected in any way and child says, I can't see very well, then we have to be much more careful. We need detailed eye examination. If the signs are more severe redness, then very likely that you may have other problems of the cornea. If the lid is extremely swollen, then it is always better to refer the child to the ophthalmologist. Sushruta, madam. So talking about allergic conjunctivitis, there could be different types. You could have seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, which will come only in the spring months, the vernal catar variety, or you could have perennial, which is present all through the year, or patient may have allergic rhinitis along with allergic conjunctivitis. Uh, Sushruta, madam. Madam, next slide. Just a moment. It might be some technical reason. Just a moment, sir. So, so common problems that we yeah, see. Hello, can you hear me right now? Yes, madam, we can hear. Yeah, so I think there is a problem in uh, sharing. Let's start slides. again. Yeah. Let's start. Let's start it. Uh, madam, can you make it full? Okay. Okay. We'll keep it like this. So, madam, uh, we can continue slowly. Go ahead. Now. Please okay. go ahead. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so like to discuss the other, you talked about uh, acute bacterial conjunctivitis viral as well as allergic. So can you tell us how do we differentiate between an infective conjunctivitis coming to an OPD and allergic conjunctivitis? So uh, allergic conjunctivitis, the predominant thing is uh, itching of the eyes and there is not too much of lid edema and uh, there's a little bit of redness of the eyes usually in the limbal location and uh, Usually, you can see some kind of darkening under the uh, lower lids, 
patient may have acidic problems like rhinitis or sneezing but when you look at viral conjunctivitis or bacterial conjunctivitis then it is an infective condition in which case we have other problems like severe lady edema uh, sticky discharge now when we want to differentiate between viral and bacterial conjunctivitis in viral it's usually a watery discharge while in bacterial mm -hmm. conjunctivitis it is a sticky discharge or a much more thicker discharge the important thing is that when we have a infective conjunctivitis many times it may so happen that uh, you may have a membrane which is sitting on the conjunctiva so when you pull the lower lid you might see a membrane there which is a very classic feature of a viral adenoviral conjunctivitis so in infective conjunctivitis there is severe lady edema severe discharge and lymphadenopathy which is a very classic sign itching may not be the predominant symptom patient may have irritation pain foreign body sensation in allergy predominant thing is itching of the eyes redness mild lady edema and occasionally watering of the eyes and a ropey discharge like a thin thread the discharge will come it is not a very thick discharge okay so how would you treat a case of allergic conjunctivitis what would be allergic, the take home messages yeah allergic conjunctivitis we try to tell them what could be the reason like sometimes it is plants which the child has come across recently or it could be pets inside the house which is recently or some kind of new carpet or sometimes a change of place which could be reason so avoiding the allergen is the first thing second thing we always uh, see if there is any systemic allergic conditions in which case we also re require the help of the pediatrician and third thing is we give them drops usually uh, we start with mild steroid drops to uh, get rid of the allergy along with uh, anti uh, histaminics or mast cell inhibitors so various drugs that we use are uh, bupotastin alkaftadine and then uh, we also use mild steroids like lotiprednol or fluoromethylone okay so for allergic conjunctivitis uh, local antihistaminics which you use how are they supposed to be used and how long are they supposed to be used so normally we give this local antihistaminics like uh, bupotastin or alkaftadine for like at least twice a day we give and usually we give it for at least 15 days to a month it's a long duration more like a maintenance therapy okay. so that the allergy will not come back very quickly we get control of the disease by using mild steroids like lotiprednol okay, okay. and uh, what i care or what 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 can you advise uh, patients to or can we advise patients to prevent to prevent the allergic onset of symptoms what we advise is even in acute allergy we tell them to give some cold compress because when you put some cold cloth on the eye the allergy symptoms reduce so whenever they come out or they are in contact with plants or pets we always ask them to wash their hands and feet and face so that they reduce the load of the allergen so that is what we routinely advise to the patients okay and what is the general course of allergic conjunctivitis how long does it take to resolve or does it come in seasons or what is the the commonest type the commonest type that we see is the vernal catarrh or the spring catarrh or the spring uh, allergic conjunctivitis which usually comes during the spring months uh, that is summer and sometimes there is a late onset during the uh, august september october months okay. uh, so this one will be only seasonal and it will resolve uh, completely uh, and then it will go away and it will come back again in the next season some of them have got a perennial conjunctivitis which is present all through the year and they keep getting this all through the year but most of the cases will resolve very uh, properly with treatment some of them become very severe allergic conjunctivitis in which case we have to go ahead and use uh, contact lenses or we give injection of steroids in the eyelid to okay. treat these cases okay. okay so now we can co covered conjunctivitis what other causes would you consider in case of a red eye a child coming with a red eye but we also have to look for other problems like keratitis or foreign bodies inside the eye can you see common. the slides which i am putting on the eye right now no madam it's not visible no no madam no sushruta we don't have slides oh actually we are projecting here but uh, i don't know why it's not going through uh, so should i stop stop share the screening then yeah 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 you stop sharing and you again start sharing sprite that way sorry you first stop the sharing and then reconnect and start the sharing just one minute yeah sure there is some technical error here i don't know what is yeah might be it might be there no problem now it is going to start go ahead yeah is it visible now
visible only no. the uh, screen not the slides we are visible only the computer i mean laptop screen is visible only no but we, we are had not we... gone for we Madam, have we to further. open the ppt and then you yes, we are we are showing green you are sharing screen it is showing that i can no let me stop let me stop share stop share open the ppt and then you share it it will come and share the ppt madam it will come now you sharing the screen it's not that's why it's not coming correct correct same ppt Why don't you open the PPT separately? Yeah, yeah, we have. And you stay. You only share the PPT. Um, is it visible now? Yes. Now it is starting. It started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's now. Ah, uh, now, now it's visible. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Correct. So sorry. Well, it is the first slide now you can go ahead according yeah. to sir okay so now we finished with the allergic bacterial and viral conjunctivitis just take on the next slide now yeah i'll just go to the stick ah, differences yeah. differences were yeah uh, correct this is differences yes. yes now it is differences slide now take home message correct yeah see take home messages hmm. yes So can you please reiterate, Doctor Ramesh, uh, the take-home messages for the audience? So in all these cases, we advise as a preventive measure washing the eyes with cold water when they come back home or when they are in contact with the allergy allergen. Also, we can use olopatadine or bupotacin drops twice a day to to uh, like a maintenance therapy so that they don't get the allergy. Steroids we should use with caution because sometimes patients get so much relief with steroids that they use it on their own and they mm-hmm. end up coming later after one or two years with problems like glaucoma or cataract. which we don't want in a small child and systemic anti allergy medications always advised uh, by pediatricians as needed okay so moving ahead to the other causes of uh, can you just elaborate on some but foreign bodies are quite common in children and we have to be very carefully uh, examine the eye with a good uh, illumination like a good torch light and you might occasionally see this kind of foreign bodies in the eye and this has to be removed because otherwise it not go what we do is we put a little bit of uh, local anesthetic agent topical drops and then we try to remove with a bud if it's not coming out then we have to possibly give a shot anesthesia and remove with a small uh, needle or something okay so other than conjunctivitis if the child comes the parents get the child with a history of a foreign body in the eye what we what should we do as pediatricians we we'll try to do an examination with the torch and see if you can find the reason okay uh, but if the reason is persisting then definitely we have to refer and see uh, carefully So, if you go to the next slide, hmm. so as I said, we remove all. Ah, this one. This is a very important slide. Okay. So, foreign bodies have to be removed, and uh, if it is just not coming out with washing with cold water, then definitely we have to refer to the eye doctor. Now, this is a child who is crying a lot and gives some history of injury, which is not very evident. If you go to the next slide, you will see uh, what exactly has happened. So what exactly has happened is uh, is that the child is having a, a large abrasion in the eye, and you can see a large. We have used fluorescein dye, and uh, we have stained it, and you can see there is a very large abrasion in the eye. So the epithelium has come out, and that is why it is very painful for the child, and the child is crying and not able to open the eyes. So in these cases, again, uh, we have to assess the child. If there is a large abrasion, we put antibiotic eye ointment and patch the eye, and it will heal with, usually within twenty four hours. Okay. So, madam, next slide. so always do a careful examination of torch light uh, if the child is crying and the eyes are not opening then definitely there is something inside the eye which is causing a problem it is usually an epithelial defect or a small foreign body or something which is irritating the eye and the problem in a child is that they will not open the eye so we have to uh, use local anesthetic agent and then we have to uh, uh, look for these epithelial defects okay uh, i'll move to the next one just a moment huh? yes i i you, uh, the other causes of red eye could you just elaborate on them and what we should be looking for the salient features only please so as i said uh, lacrimal duct block so if there is a block in the duct system then a lot of discharge will be collecting there 
So there's a risk of secondary bacterial infection from the lacrimal sac region. Um, and this will also give rise to a red eye in these cases. Then the eyelid will be edematous and there will always be co constant red eye. And with this, we have elaborated in our talk. The other important problem is the orbital cellulitis or the preceptor cellulitis. So what happens is a uh, child may present, as you can see in the picture, with severe late edema. There is bulging of the eyes. There is swelling of the eyelids, the forehead and the cheeks. There could be lymphadenopathy. So we have to differentiate between orbital cellulitis and preceptal cellulitis. So preceptal cellulitis is the earliest stage where there is very less risk. And this will usually resolve with uh, oral antibiotics and uh, anti-inflammatory. The orbital cellulitis is the serious problem where there is high risk for vision loss. There is high risk for brain involvement or spread through the optic nerve. So how do we differentiate between the two? The preceptal is the anterior infection. So in this case, there is no proptosis. The eye movements will be full. Usually the conjunctiva will be white in color. The pupil will be reacting. Child will not be very feverish and not very sick. On the contrary, in orbital cellulitis, as you can see in this picture, this is orbital cellulitis classic. Severe lady edema, there is bulging of the eyes or proptosis. The eye movements are limited. Pupils may get affected. You can see uh, when you do a, a pupil examination by shining the torchlight from one pupil to the other, you may notice that the pupil is not reacting uh, properly. It is sluggish in reaction. You may also notice that there is a loss or reduction of vision. Patient may also be very sick with high fever and uh, generally they will feel very uh, fatigued and tired. So this is a classic orbital cellulitis. Orbital cellulitis is a medical emergency. We have to admit the patient, give them IV antibiotics. We have to do a imaging, MRI scan of the eye of the orbits to find out how much of extent the infection is there and how where all it is spreading. The third differential which will come is a subperiosteal abscess, which is very common in children. So what happens frequently is that the ethmoid sinusitis will spread through the uh, aperture in the bones and it will reach the medial orbitals region or the superior orbital region. And in that region, you will have a small collection of pus under the periosteum. This again presents in this picture. And uh, this has to be drained in many of the cases. And spontaneous can occur occasionally, but generally it has to be drained. So subperiosteal abscess, which is a spread from the ethmoid sinusitis, is also very common in these cases. So that is the second uh, important uh, differential diagnosis. Glaucoma again could be present. And you can see here that this is a case of buphthalmos or a bull's eye. Here you can see that the pressure is very high and the color of the cornea itself has changed. This is a very classic picture which you can easily see that the size of the cornea or there is asymmetry in the size of the cornea between the two eyes, which indicates that there is glaucoma. Other problems are like a corneal ulcer or a keratitis. Now this is a very serious problem uh, because there is a proper infection of the cornea. And this infection, if now in this case, it is a small infiltration, the small area of like a pinpoint, there is infection. This will resolve very easily with drops. But if it becomes larger, then it may actually give rise to a permanent corneal opacity once it heals. So we also have to look inside the eye if there is any pus. We never take any corneal ulcer lightly. We always try to differentiate whether it is bacterial or fungal or any other organism. Fungal is usually slow uh, to heal and it takes a long time to resolve. Bacterial will resolve fast, but bacteria can be equally dangerous and it can damage the eye within 24 to 48 hours. So we have to be very cautious about corneal ulcers, which can also be a cause of red eye. Entropion is a condition in which the lid is turned inside. So because the lid is turned inside, the lashes are rubbing the cornea. So we have entropion and this can also give rise to chronic irritation of the conjunctiva and redness of the eyes. Rarely you will have problems like retinoblastoma where there is acute inflammation and this can give rise to um, uh, red eyes. But usually retinoblastoma we can see very easily by looking at the reflex inside the eye. And if there is any suspicion or any family history, then definitely we should get the, the children or the siblings examined by the eye doctor who will perform a dilated fundus examination of the child. Uveitis as such is rare. Uh, Uveitis as such is very rare. And what you may see is the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis cases where uh, any child who's got rheumatoid arthritis, it's, uh, it's best to refer to the eye doctor. The juvenile rheumatoid arthritis patient is very typical because they don't have red eye. They will have all the problems of uveitis, but they don't usually have red eye. 
because of the nature of the disease uh, and inside the eye you will have uh, you may have cataract you may have uh, pupils which are irregular these problems could be present so these are the common uh, things which can cause red eye uh, if the patient needs primary management i'll already advise give some antibiotic drops initially you can always call them back for a review do not ignore the red eye and when you feel uh, things are not looking good then better to refer uh, to the eye doctor Uh, so thank you dr ramesh muti for giving us a brief overview of what to what to look for when a child is brought with a red eye to us uh, i would like to uh, does any of the other panelists want to add anything specific to anything extra which is different from this any additional points no he has covered it extensively i think it was a very good overview and bird's eye view of the red eye okay so can i ask dr varimbe i can can i ask you a question is uh, yeah, can sure. you just quickly give us points where, where we should be quickly referring uh, a patient uh, with a red eye to an ophthalmologist firstly the basic <laughs> thing is what sign. yeah basic oh, things so what uh, he has already mentioned but on if on torch light if you see for example if you see a corneal ulcer or an abrasion or a obvious foreign body which has been impacted in the cornea it's always better to refer it okay or even if okay. there is and, yes yeah and, and other would, things uh, i think he has already mentioned so no need to repeat it again and uh, how would we uh, able to differentiate whether cornea is involved or it's just merely restricting to conjunctiva because if corneal involvement is there it should be quick referral so can you give us clinical pie clues as to how to differentiate between con conjunctivitis and uh, keratitis yeah it's a very good question uh, actually what because sometimes even the corneal abrasions won't be visible to the naked eye so uh, one simple thing what you can do is uh, you can just stain the uh, the conjunctiva with the help of a fluorescein dye you can do you always have this fluorescein autoclave or uh, sterilized strips you just put some a uh, uh, little amount of uh, saline on it and uh, touch that fluorescein okay. strip to the conjunctiva and if you see uh, you know the staining of that ulcer on the cornea or if you see obvious foreign body it's always better to refer it if okay. there is a small abrasion you can just uh, put some ointment and patch the eye and uh, you, you usually within a 24 or 48 hours it usually heals but if there is a major problem so always better to refer to the nearest eye specialist okay but clinically how would we suggest how would the picture suggest a corneal involvement as against a pure conjunctival extreme photophobia or lacrimation or something no it uh, normally extreme photophobia or lacrimation or inability to open the eye will be present more in corneal lesions as a, as against to conjunctival lesions uh, in conjunctival lesions you'll have more of a discharge sometimes because of the conjunctivitis because of even the trauma can affect the uh, conjunctiva also but the corneal lesions will be more painful and there will be inability to open eye more in corneal lesions as compared to conjunctival lesions okay and uh, what and uh, what antibiotic drops would you prefer and with what frequency should they be instilled and for how long uh usually we prefer to use it at least for 7 days uh, okay. uh preferable antibiotics will be tobramycin or moxifloxacin better to avoid gatifloxacin or other antibiotics especially in a small quills less than 1 okay. year and as against uh, uh, ointment or drops what would what would be the personal choice and why so yeah if see uh, if there is a, a abrasion or if there is a, you know uh, integrity of the eyeball is at stake suppose there is a trauma there is a, a lesion on the cornea the inside contents are come out so it's always better to avoid ointment because it uh, it can go inside the eye and the preservatives can damage the cor the cornea from inside so in such cases usually preservative free eye drops are usually used but many a times for small kids putting up the drops is is a huge task they just don't allow you to put the drops so in such patients ointment would be better okay and one more last note on uh, drops which are available with a steroid combination so uh, should they, should they be used if at all when and if not why yeah it's again a very good question and should be a good take home message for to for everyone steroid drops usually what happens especially for allergic conjunctivitis we use it very judiciously when the other drops usually fail so usually it's a last resort they are like a double edged sword 
they will kill the symptoms but at the same time they will have some side effects if used injudiciously so preferably we should avoid steroid drops and leave that to the treating eye specialist because many times whenever the patients find that after putting these drops the eye becomes immediately white they go on putting these drops and afterwards we do see such kids with a intractable glaucoma the congenital the developmental or the steroid induced cataracts and the patients usually lose vision so steroid drops should be used very judiciously under supervision in consultation with the eye specialist so a big no to general use of steroid drop and antibacterial drop combination yes. would be the take home message right yes absolutely thank you dr vaidhi now i would like to ask dr zai uh, uh one is sometimes brought in the opd with the sticky eye discharge but uh, with matting of the eyelids but there is no actual redness so what would be the causes and what should we do about it okay uh, good morning ma'am good morning everyone Uh, so this is why i think one of the most common problems that uh, us pediatricians must be encountering uh, usually but if you have a newborn um, then and it he has watering then it's usually the nasolacrimal duct obstruction because normal tearing does not begin before 3 months of age even the baby is wailing he will not have uh, copious tears like uh, the older children so it's usually a nasolacrimal duct obstruction which is the most common reason for watering but there can be other another um, serious concern that you should be looking at is a congenital glaucoma for congenital glaucoma i will definitely look uh, a lot different or sinister i would say rather than the uh, as compared to the i with just a congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction uh, the child um, otherwise the child will be very comfortable but that i will appear slightly smaller and you can always see that the eye is absolutely watery and more so near the medial punctum and they will say that the parents will also give history that it's been watering since birth so more often than not the diagnosis will shift towards the congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction but if you find that the corneal diameters are not equal in both eyes or the corneal clarity is not same in both eyes then definitely it's not just congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction it could be glaucoma so okay. you have to look for that now this i said about a neonate who's not having a red eye what if this neonate had a red eye with a sticky discharge what would be your suggestion okay so if it's a red eye with a sticky discharge then it will either most commonly point towards an infective uh, etiology but, but the infection uh, different in the neonate as compared to an older child the causes so the infection is? the causes will be different earlier we used to have this ophthalmia neonatorum yes so yes. after delivery uh, but then nowadays i think these cases are very less uh, okay. we hardly ever have these patients but any child with uh, yellow uh, discharge and watering red eye definitely it points towards an infective etiology then you need antibiotic drops but then uh, for such a young age not all antibiotics will be uh, safe moxifloxacin uh, is a broad spectrum and a very safe antibiotic for uh, these children and preser- preferably pre- preservative free because these preservatives can incite a allergic reaction in these babies okay okay so now we move to the next topic uh, the next question is again to dr ramesh murthy about screen time now everybody is doing uh, virtual education and all that is going on so how much screen time is okay what damage does it do and uh, how what tips would be give to parents to decrease uh, the uh, damage caused due to screen eye so i'll do to screen sharing screen sorry so dr murthy can you can you see the slide no but we have to share the screen yeah just a minute just a minute and see in these times uh, because of uh, online classes and online teaching and also online yeah. assignments uh the problem of screen time has come in the biggest problem of screen time is that uh, there is a high risk of myopia and myopia progression the theory behind this is that the child is constantly looking at a near object and so uh, the ciliary muscles are not acting in the right way and they're always in a state of tension and therefore the images are more likely to get focused in front of the eyes and that is why the child will develop myopia so uh, it is now well established by various research articles that the risk of minus number or myopia or myopia increasing rapidly is more likely in a child who spends more time indoors so that is the biggest problem we are facing uh, and again a damage to retina by uv rays people have proposed this as a problem uh, the problem of dry eyes and of course other psychological problems which you must be encountering so this is the biggest problem of excess screen time in a child now as regards when we can go to next slide Yes, this is the next 
so as regards the screen time madam uh, screen is not sh shared yeah again it's on just one so as regards the screen time uh, in a very young child maybe uh, first for one to three or four years of life better is not to give any screen time to the child at all because it's not needed at all it is always better that the child should play outdoors and have some amount of sun exposure which will be the most useful thing uh, so it will be helpful uh, yeah is it visible so, now yes it's visible Yes, so up okay. to 3 years of age uh, there is no need for uh, any screen time between 4 to 5 years of age maybe 1 to 1 and a half hours uh, with breaks and when the child becomes older maybe 7 to 12 years about 3 to 4 hours per day with 2 to 3 breaks and an older child within 12 to 16 years they obviously will have more uh, assignments more studies so they can go up to 6 to 8 hours per day with 5 to 6 breaks including a long lunch break now the purpose of the break is to relax the eye muscles so the child will look at distant objects so when we look at a distant object the ciliary muscles and the muscles of the eye do not have to work at all so how can we guide the parents and the teachers we can tell them about the 20 20 20 rule which means 20 seconds break every 20 minutes and to look at 20 feet good posture where the back is straight physical activities always help because any kind of physical activity will relax the eyes and the chance that the child will also have sun exposure so the chance that child uh, will develop myopia is going to be less always use a bigger screen the screen should be at least 18 to 24 inches away and slightly lower level so that it will not affect the posture of the child screen protectors are useful because we can prevent the uv light from hitting the eye directly and always to have good illumination around the, uh, the the digital device like a laptop or a mobile or an ipad ac and fan use should be limited because that will prevent dry eyes too much of neck bending is not advised and if they have spectacles they should use spectacles regularly but the next slide uh, yeah that that brings to the bring us, brings us to the end of this uh, screen hazard or uh, does anybody want to add the panelists anybody want to add tips which we could give parents or this should be fine but one important thing is about the myopia and the myopia progression which has become a very big uh, important topic for uh, all the ophthalmologists and for the entire community because myopia is going to become an epidemic it's already an epidemic in many countries like singapore and hong kong and china and the other southeast asian countries so it's a big epidemic where nearly 60% of the children are going to be myopic in india also slowly uh, the ch children with minus number is increasing quite rapidly because of more indoor work less outdoor work so to prevent this myopia we have different means one is as i said physical exercise sun exposure playing outdoors the other thing is the use of atropine eye drops that we routinely use uh, to prevent the progression of myopia it's a very low concentration atropine that we use so one okay. person make or zai zai madam you can highlight little bit sir uh, yeah this is uh, only thing a uh, very uh, important thing don't use the routine atropine drops because many times even the uh, children or their parents put the 1% atropine drops which will cause cycloplegia and the child will not be able to see near things so the these specific drops are of 0.01% concentration and should be specifically mentioned and these drops usually should be used under supervision only yeah i and, have one more question in the chat box as to whether lubricant eye drops will help those having a slightly more screen time excuse me 5 minutes are remaining huh? uh actually we have two and, more topics to cover can we quickly go through them then yeah uh so shruta madam can you just go to my slides uh, uh i would request you to go first run through my all slides so that there is no confusion and uh, i think most of your questions will be answered with my slides so can you go uh, to my presentation please yeah just one minute you have to first start sharing screen So the question to you in the meantime till we share the screen is uh, when a child is brought with squint by the parents what would be the approach yeah uh, precisely in my presentation i'll be showing how you can diagnose squint when to refer and what are the uh, uh, other specific tests which you all can do so i think if you can go to the screen sharing i, yes, I should yes, be able to yeah just we are doing that Yes, can you see this? No, no. You stop share screening first, and then you again do start share screen. Yeah, 
yes it has started but the screen is not visible yet so can you quickly can is is it visible now uh no uh, it just go no 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 it's a different slide can it goes to next slide please see is it visible uh yeah 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 okay so if you can quickly go through the slides sir so that we can have uh yeah can you go to the first slide please so that you know i, I should be i will just go quickly run it should take just 5 minutes or so so that many of your questions will be answered with my slides okay just go pre no okay then you can go next slide please i'll just project the slide and if you can talk on that yeah yeah just go to the next slide yeah when we uh, discuss about squint no go to the previous slide please okay when i say next you can just go to the okay. next slide previous slide please yeah it yes. now this is a quite interesting slide because if you know what is a normal neonatal alignment then you, know, you will understand uh, what is abnormal so uh, most newborns usually do not have straight eyes and if you see only 30% of the normal neonates have straight eyes around 69% have divergent squint or exotropia or a variable angle squint strabismus means squint and less than 1% have esotropia so it's quite evident that esotropia or a convergent squint or the eyes moving inside infrequently occurs at birth and that that persistent esotropia or the persistent convergent squint beyond 2 months of age is definitely pathological and deserves ophthalmic evaluation so i feel if uh, we all can have a couple of uh, take home messages from this all presentation it will be worthwhile because uh, it's a myth in parents and even in some ophthalmologists as well as pediatricians that bachcha bada hone ke baad to squint apne aap theek ho jayega no so if there is a persistent esotropia even after 2 months of age it is definitely pathological and it requires proper ophthalmic evaluation next slide please next slide yes yes i am yeah so squint you can diagnose in your clinic very easily just shine a torch light and you should see the corneal reflex in the center for both eyes now if the one of the reflex is going inside the eye is moving towards the nose it's we call it as a esotropia or a convergent squint or if it is goes outside it's called as a exotropia or a divergent squint that can be up or down or a cyclo rotated also so if you can see this squint oh, one more one more thing in that uh many a times the mother or the father says there is a squint and when you observe there is no squint but more than 90% of the times the mother is correct because uh, in a condition called as intermittent squints whenever you observe there may not be any squint but when the child is tired or under when the child is feeling sleepy or when the child is uh, under exam stress or something the squint usually reappears now another myth is squint always requires surgery no if the child is caught at the right time and if you give proper glasses even simple measures like giving glasses can correct the squint and you can salvage the child's vision also next slide this is another example this one was a missed esotropia if the child is having convergent squint motha zalavar to apop bara hoil aso vatta parents na if you look carefully you will see a leukocoria in the left eye the white pupillary reflex and if you don't treat it at the right time next slide it can fungate like this a leukocoria with a convergent squint there can be underlying retinoblastoma so you might lose the vision as well as the child if you don't treat it at the right time next slide please uh, sir actually uh, yes. the, the next topic is red eye reflex the yeah i'll just i'm just i am just covering all the three topics in one go so can okay. you go to next slide please Sir, this is the next slide actually. Yeah, next to that, I have my slides. Uh, how to do the red eye reflex? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So how you can do this red eye reflex test or a Bruckner test? Uh, the child should sit on the lap of a mother or a father. You dim the uh, uh, clinic lightings or just uh, put down the curtain so that there is a little darkness in the room. You should have a coaxial illumination or a direct ophthalmoscope or a retinoscope. and sit at a distance of 1 meter 
and ask the, uh, basically whenever you shine that light the child will look at the light you intuitively first see the right eye then left eye and then you see both eyes simultaneously the light which passes through the child's eye it gets reflected from the choroidal vessels as well as the red, as well as the retinal surface and you'll see a red glow just like the same glow which you see after taking photographs so if in this slide you will see a normal reflex normally should be a uniformly illuminated red glow in both eyes now many important interpretations can be drawn from this red reflex test and when you see the both reflex at the same time is known as a bruckner test which is a very easy convenient and very useful test which you all can do in your clinic and which will definitely give us many interpretations you can diagnose squint on that you can diagnose even the high refractive errors you can diagnose even the uh, some serious conditions like a leukocoria or a cataract or retinoblastoma also if you are, now you, here you can see one of the reflex is white it it can be because of the underlying cataract it can be because of the advanced rop or retinopathy of prematurity it can be because of the intraocular tumors so in such patients in which you will see a cat's eye reflex or a white reflex on the red eye reflex these patients should be immediately referred for the further management next slide please yeah now this bruckner test in, in fact it has been advocated that you all should do this bruckner test which should take just a few seconds you as i have mentioned you sit at a distance of 1 meter and in the first a picture the topmost picture that's a normal reflex which you will see normal red eye reflex in b or the second picture you will see a small crescent superior crescent if the child is having high hypermetropy or a plus number you will see such pictures if you there will be more Uh, illuminated superior crescent. If there is a in the illuminated inferior crescent, like in picture C, the child is most likely having a high myopia. In picture D, you will see a little white reflex in the right eye. So it can be because of say cataract. It can be because of the retinal problem. It can be because of the retinoblastoma. If there is squint, normally the deviated eye or the affected eye will have a little brighter reflex. so depending on the color of the reflex depending on the brightness of the reflex many conclusions you can draw you can diagnose the high refractive errors you can diagnose squint you can diagnose media opacities like corneal scarring cataract retinal pathology with the help of this simple bruckner test next slide please so now we move on to the next topic which is amblyopia very difficult yeah, so I, yes yes yes, yes. so can you just yeah can you just, can you yeah. can you just suspect Is yes, it's, it's a very good question. Can you just go to the next slide so that you know? Shishu, the time is less, sir. Please. Yeah. Ah, yes, sir. Can you yeah. just? Yeah, the amblyopia was uh, uh, diagnosed way back in the 400 BC by Hippocrates as a dull or a lazy eye. But mainly, it's a condition in which the observer also sees nothing and the patient very little. Meaning, thereby, anatomically, the eye is perfectly normal. but the child is not able to see there are various causes of amblyopia like because of the squint because of the high refractive error which has not been treated or uh, sometimes the child has got a long standing cataract or ptosis or some corneal opacity so even if you treat it at a later age anatomically the eye will look better but the child's vision will be very less can you get to next slide can i just now uh, yeah i i'll just run through the slides uh, uh, i know it's a little exhaustive list of clinical features but amblyopia is very difficult to diagnose from the pediatricians in the pediatricians clinic so if you know the simple uh, clinical features at least you will be able to suspect the child is having amblyopia for example uh, there is a separation difficulty or crowding the child is not able to copy the uh, uh, sentences on the blackboard it is known as a crowding phenomenon next slide or sometimes the child is has what little lesser accommodation so wrongly these children are labeled as a slower learners or learning disability but if you uh, do careful ophthalmic examination they are found to have amblyopia and if you treat amblyopia all these difficulties are vanished next slide please can i skip this one yeah no, no that is okay now interestingly uh, these children see a little better in dim light so mother usually says the 
child usually puts off curtains, decreases the light and uh, tries to read. So usually amlabs try to read in a mesopic conditions. Their fine motor skills are reduced, especially in the squint as, uh, associated with amblyopia. Saccades are decreased, there can be nystagmus. And in, in fact, sometimes they, you will see some psychomotor features also. We'll skip the, yeah. So let us come to the treatment options. The mainstay of treatment for amblyopia is still patching. Patching the, pro, uh, the basic rationale of patching is you patch the good eye so that the amblyopic eye or the lazy eye is put into action. Although we have other treatment modalities also like occlusion or some drugs, some home vision therapies, refractive surgeries, and especially in the current COVID times, even the uh, some new frontiers have come up. Next slide, please. The purpose of putting this slide is basically, uh, you should all know that many treatment options are available. You can treat the amyloid within the past amyloidogenic age, even after the nine years of age also, although success rate is not very good, but still you can use these methods. Like these are some computer games, which a child can do at their homes. These are FDA approved and uh, without patching, we can do all these things. Now, who should be referred for eye checkup? So a routine eye checkup should be done at the three years of age. All children which have developmental delays, learning disability, genetic syndromes, all prematures and low birth weight babies, obvious eye problems like squint and lazy eye. Next slide, please. So what would the take-home message for uh, amblyopia, for preventing amblyopia? So the take-home message is very simple. You have to catch them young. So if you we catch the purpose of putting the all clinical features of amblyopia was if you can catch even one child, you'll be very happy that you have salvaged the child's vision. Simple mm -hmm. evaluation tools, which you can do in your office, like simple vision testing or a red reflex or a Bruckner test, detection of squint, will go a long way in you know, salvaging their vision. We have to detect it timely and a closer liaison is required between pediatricians, ophthalmologists and other specialties so that you can effectively manage the pediatric patient's eye problems. Okay, thank you, sir, for your good uh, input on squint and amblyopia. We move ahead to the last question of this series. Uh, I would request Dr. Zai to be, um, and we are pressed for time and I understand, but I would request Dr. Zai to be very brief and quick about the next question. Okay. So basically, you want to talk about the red flag signs in ocular examination, and when should I refer? When should we refer very early? Okay, so if you can start my slides and just go to the last slide directly. Okay, just one minute. Because almost everything has been exhaustively covered by Dr. Murthy and Dr. Vayambe sir. So okay, but, uh, I think everybody's got the gist that anything funny you see, better that you. Refer. Okay. So, yeah, I'll go yeah, to the yeah, last slide. Next one. Yeah. Okay. You want this one? No, next one. Yeah, we spoke about congenital glaucoma. Anisocoria, if you can wait a minute on it. Um, anisocoria is a difference in the size of the pupils. Usually in brown eyes, it's very difficult to identify the difference. But why I put this slide here is because there is an um, entity called congenital Horner syndrome. It's a neuroblastoma and uh, it definitely should be picked up and you will find that there is a difference in the size of the pupil. The affected pupil does not dilate. So it's the small pupil, which is the pathological pupil. It's the anisocoria in dim light. There are two different types of anisocoria, anisocoria in bright light, anisocoria in dim light. So this, uh, if you switch off the room lights and just shine a torch on the nose of the tip of the nose and you find that there's a difference in the pupil size, then uh, definitely warrants urgent referral. Sometimes there will be a change in the iris color also, so heterochromia, and there will be this blue color uh, in the congenital Horner's child. Mm. Next, please. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we can go to the last one. I have included that in the last one. The retinopathy? Ah, the ROPS, the retinopathy of prematurity is a very uh, emerging topic for all of us. Yeah. Because uh, not only just because the baby is premature, it has gained a lot of medical legal significance also. Yeah, so, so basically, what are the quick referral things which we can see when the child... Okay, so if you notice different. that any of these things, uh, symptoms, uh, this is just an overview of all the three talks, I'll say. If there are swollen, encrusted lids which are not responding to routine treatment, uh, there are some sty or recurrent styes around the eye that can also be uh, a reason that the child has a refractive error uncorrected, which, which is why they're getting it. There can be drooping eyelids, which is called ptosis. Ptosis is a big reason why children have astigmatism uh, and therefore amblyopia. And again, as Bainbesser said, amblyopia requires catch them young therapy. 
the child is not making an eye contact with you even by 3 months of age when the parents get it, get the child to you or the child is not looking with a steady gaze maybe not at your face because first the child will prefer looking at the mother if that's not happening definite referral is required if the child does not watch or follow objects even after by around 6 months of age at least because then you are even ruling out the delayed visual maturation so by 6 months at least they should be following colored or um, light objects or at least for a uh, short distance if there is any haziness or whitish appearance inside the pupil like leukocoria there is frequent movement of the eye like the sometimes parents may say the eye keeps on moving wriggling drifting jerky movements all these descriptions are there this indicate nystagmus which can either be congenital or it can harbor some dangerous pathology there is lack of coordinated eye movements there is drifting of eye when looking at objects that means there is a squint there is a tilting of head when looking at objects this can occur in slightly older children around 3 to 4 years of age there is squinting or closing one eye whenever they want to look at some object carefully then there is excessive tearing even when the child is not crying then there is excessive blinking excessive rubbing or constant touching of the eyes and avoidance or extreme sensitivity to bright light if any of these things are happening then definitely the child is not malingering he is having some problem and should be referred usually extreme sensitivity to light will indicate that there is the corneal involvement only conjunctivitis will not give them extreme sensitivity to light so when the cornea is involved it's almost impossible for the child to open the eye and they are very um, not in a very good mood they will be crying um, and very very un- we should not label them as just uncooperative children they probably there's some problem with their cornea one quick last question is uh, hmm. what time is the outer limit for accepting of the eye is not fixating Six months beyond six months, if the child is not fixing and following at all, then definitely because uh, three months is the time when usually most neonates will start fixing uh, fixing light. By six months, they will start uh, fixing and following objects also. Usually by six months, most infants will have near normal visual activity, which is six, twenty by twenty so or no six fixation, by six. So no hmm. fixation beyond. But there is no fixation that. or wandering movements or uh, poor fixation, momentary fixation, even after six months of age. then definitely the child should be referred okay and one last question there was a lot of even cry about vitamin a deficiency so how ra- rampant is mm-hmm. it and do we need to supplement and if so in what doses uh, many uh, parents ask us whether for their eye problem should we as ophthalmologists be prescribing them vitamin a supplements but vitamin a as far as i know is a very uh, funny kind of a vitamin because there can be more problems with hypervitaminosis and i think the indian pediatric schedule has uh, included uh, the vaccination includes a dose of vitamin a also so vitamin a deficiency will be seen in extreme malnutrition where there will be problems with uh, light adaptation you will have xerosis of the conjunctiva later on xerosis of the cornea so if, unless the child is having good nutrition usually we will not see a uh, vitamin a deficiency that common But okay, if so you are suspecting uh, malnutrition, then definitely it should it's be. But it's not for glasses or anything. Okay, okay. And one last quick question: routine eye care. What eye care should we uh, parents ask? How should eye care be taken at home? Would be the last question. Okay. So most common uh, problem that children have is they don't wash their eyes properly. So blepharitis is very common in small children. You can act. actually see dandruff flakes and crusts deposited on their eyelid margins so then they, they have frequent sty they are constantly rubbing their eyes so just keep the eyes clean do not allow the child to rub their eyes if children are in a very uh, whenever they are bored whenever they are sleepy they'll start rubbing their eyes and this starts becoming an habit and later on can develop into a very serious problem called as keratoconus so at all i at all costs eye rubbing should be discouraged if you just keep the eyes clean just wash them twice or thrice a day properly and take care that the eyelids the eyelid margins that the eyelashes are clean then it should be not a problem and also watch if the child is going too close to the tv to uh, look at the tv not just out of interest just because they are not able to see clearly if they are holding the book very close to the face if there is a family history of glasses or any eye problem then the children definitely need a eye checkup if it's not possible to bring them before when they are very young at least by 3 years of age each and every child should have an eye checkup okay So thank you the panelists for a good interactive session and we got valuable inputs from this uh, so thank you Dr Kekar Dr Varimbe and Dr Rajesh Murthy uh, handing handing over the podium now to Dr uh, Mudgerikar thank, thank you Dr Sushruta and thank all the panelists for a wonderful session now we will move on to our next uh, topic uh,
रिफ्रैक्टरी एरर्स नॉट टू मिस बाय डॉक्टर जाई केड़कर शी इज असोसिएट एडिटर फॉर पीडियाट्रिक ऑप्थमोलॉजी फॉर आईजेओ she is a reviewer for few peer reviewed journals she has 34 publications till date she is a recipient of azeo gold medal in 2019 she is a recipient of apao achievement award in 2021 she is a vice president of pune ophthalmological society also she is a amateur painter and marathon runner over to uh, dr zai kerkar thank you ma'am and here the next slide okay उज्ज्वला मैम स्टॉप शेयरिंग जय मैडम यू कैन स्टार्ट विल नीड सम प्रॉम्प्ट यू कैन सी द स्लाइड्स एट ऑल यू कैन गो टू द प्रेजेंटेशन एंड so oh, from there you can can uh, uh, share the screen go to the presentation whatever presentation you have and from there you can share the screen शीतल प्रेजेंटेशन असेल तर तुम्ही करा शेअर माझ्याकडे नाही एनी प्रॉब्लेम नो आय हॅड सेंड दॅट पॉवर पॉईंट विच वर आस्क फॉर दुलर डेव्हलपमेंट थिंग ओके शीतल एनी अदर ओके what are the can make this interactive if you have any questions about refractive errors i can answer them okay save time uh, susruda madam susruda hello uh, actually there was a talk on refractive error right ah uh, no susruda madam uh, mm-hmm. uh, we can have a question answer session you can ask uh, two three questions about refractive error to the paper <laughs> no, okay so otherwise i can tell you Yeah, what were the tell you about the refractive overview ah yes yes okay so uh, refractive errors these days we see that there's a myopia epidemic that the world is facing um, first thing for the parents uh, to understand is that refractive errors are not uh, the child does not get glasses just because they are using the mobile or the laptop for a long time it is usually a genetic problem if the parents have glasses then the child is more likely to have glasses if either of the parents has glasses then there's a 50% chance that the child will have glasses mm-hmm. so by 3 to 4 years of age it's a good idea to get the children uh, checked myopia is more common we can we also get cases with hypermetropia and astigmatism uh, the symptoms that the child will show for each is different for uh, myopia you will find that the child is holding the book very close to the face or they were going very close to the tv but that will be seen if it's a high myopia more than 3 4 then only they will be going that close usually for if it's a low myopia like one or two then while reading and writing usually the child is uh, not at all having any problem and nowadays since they don't have classrooms they are not looking at the blackboard so these cases of low myopia tend to get missed because they don't have to look at far off things they compensate uh, watching the tv usually on the by uh, switching on the youtube on the uh, laptop itself so by 3 to 4 years of age it's better that we uh, get the child checked and usually we will require uh, cycloplegic drops to be put in the eye so that the full number is manifest we do not want to overcorrect in these uh, cases uh, the number also will go on increasing as the height of the child will go on increasing so every 6 monthly uh, we have to keep checking uh, look for the uh, the power is correct and the child is able to read the detection of uh, amblyopia also will happen in this case usually my more than myopia hypermetropia is the more amblyogenic uh, refractive uh, anybody with plus 3 or plus 4 usually the parents will complain that initially their handwriting was quite good but nowadays they are just too bored to write or the handwriting is really going down then you can have some uh, idea or there sometimes an abnormal head posture by the hypermetropes uh, which is adopted usually a chin down posture they will see like this so if the child is adopting funny head postures also which was not there previously or looking at the screen sometime they will tilt their heads to one side you know, either they'll see like this or they'll see like this 
whenever they want to see anything closely they will start that. so if the child is tilting their head while watching distant objects it could be an astigmatism that is present astigmatism also can give rise to that is having cylindrical powers can give rise to amblyopia so that also has to be looked at another important thing is if the child is spending too much time indoors and they are not going outdoors and playing too much of near work as dr murthy uh, sir pointed out then there will be a rise in myopia very fast some amount of myopia is always going to rise because we have to make uh, concessions for growth as the child grows the number also will grow but anything more than 0.5 or maximum 0.75 in one year if it's increasing beyond that then definitely it comes under uh, progressive myopia so for such situations there is there are the atropine drops low dose atropine drops which are available any child with a high number should not be prescribed just because they have a high number they should be getting atropine is not the dictum if there is progression beyond 0.5 in one year then the child should be started on uh, myopia myopine drops and they are to be put for a long period of time say at least till 14 15 years of age so uh, they should not be started indiscriminately and encouraging outdoor activity in the child is very important everybody with glasses should go out and play they should have some physical activity at least for 45 minutes every day they will also get the sun as well as they will be going out and relaxing their ciliary muscles and some break from the prolonged near work uh, the screen time should be limited even if it's not screen if they are into habit of uh, reading books then they should also be at least a gap of say every half an hour they should uh, maybe just look out of the window for 2 to 3 minutes and make it a rule because initially they'll remember but later on they will not be doing that they're in a habit of reading and reading for long hours sustained continuous hours and reading in dim light should always be discouraged the light should be adequate light should fall on the reading material children will have a tendency to sit with their back to the light so the light should fall on the uh, reading material the posture should be good so these are the some few things that uh, as pediatricians and as a uh, counselor for the parents before we see them be telling the parents madam in case of refractive errors can you hear me yeah i can hear you okay, so in case of refractive errors how frequently should they be com- coming for uh, regular uh, yeah, at least every 6 monthly they should be checked okay and plus uh, many parents ask that they are high myopes or they are high mm-hmm. high high, high my up so uh-huh. uh, should there be early screening for uh, children of such parents and when should we start uh, ideally yeah so usually by 3 years is a good age because if you do detect glasses by a 3 year old will at least wear glasses a 2 year old 1 year old may not wear glasses but sometimes some uh, children have huge numbers even from first year of life but these will be exceptions and the parents will already notice that the child is not seeing properly so they will be picked up if everything is going fine parents have glasses then at least by 3 years of age the child should be definitely checked by an ophthalmologist and if there is no history of glasses in the parents still should refer still to at the 3 years or 4 years at least get the eye check up because as i said the children are cooperative much cooperative that time so we can have a good assessment as well as if they require glasses then the compliance for glasses also is good so irrespective of family irrespective of having yes at least by 3 years of age each and every child should have an eye check up and uh, is there a tendency for hypometropia to grow out to for them to grow out of hypometropia but myopia to increase yes usually uh, myopia will increase hypermetropia also depends if it's a high hypermetropia then the child will not grow out of it if it's a low hypermetropia then we have, do see a few cases um, who they do grow out of it but that will be after 10 or 12 years of age then we will start seeing that emetropization happening Okay. sometimes we can even give under correction and uh, start pushing them towards emetropization but if it's a very low myopia hypermetropia like less than plus 3 uh, dr parag would you like to ask some questions mm-hmm. hello okay i i feel that should be good for uh, refractive errors and thank you so much for okay. giving us a bird eye view as well as in depth analysis of uh, uh, refractive errors in children thank you so yes, much dr you. taker yes. and hand thank over you. to dr mudgeri karna uh, thank you dr taker madam it was a uh, very informative uh, informative session Uh, now uh, today is observed as shahid divas or martyrs day to commemorate the death anniversary of Do- uh, mahatma gandhi and also we have lost dr poddar this year so uh, we will observe a 30 second silence starting from now Thank <laughs> you.
yes thank you uh, now we will move on to our next session उजवाड़ी she has mentored surgeons in india and abroad to start cochlear implant programs she has considerable experience with all ent and head and neck surgeries she has special interest in otology cochlear implantation anterior and lateral skull based surgeries endoscopic sinus surgeries she has more than 40 publications in national and international peer reviewed journals she has written uh, chapters for two pediatric textbooks she is a faculty at numerous national and international conferences and meetings over to dr neelam vid ma'am uh, thank you so much uh, dr ujwala for that introduction and uh, thank you very much to iip for the kind invitation to be a part of this uh, academic program uh, could i please share my screen now is my screen visible yes ma'am yes ma'am great can you do it full screen only yeah it's there. now no it's visible uh, sure so i'm going to be talking about hearing impairment uh, in children as today's invitation is from the uh, academy of uh, pediatrics the objectives of this morning talk would be i will talk a bit about the importance of early detection um, with primary focus on neonatal hearing screening when do we refer patients to uh, ent or to audiology for hearing evaluation and if time permits a bit about cochlear implantation and baha uh, just to start off the facts that most of us are already may be aware about that hearing loss is the most common sensory deficit that we see in children and when we look at the statistics uh, as published by who in 2018 we know today that about 34 million children have uh, disabling hearing loss and this is rising as uh, we speak even now when we look at the prevalence of hearing loss in children across various uh, parts of the world as you can see south asia really dominates the rest of the continents you're looking at an estimated prevalence of about 2% of childhood onset deafness and that is quite a significant number if one was to just compare that 2% to the population of our country among the various causes there are about 40% that are non preventable and that irrespective of what we as clinicians and parents are going to try and do uh, the child is going to inevitably get a hearing loss but there is about a 60% which is preventable and it is this one that we all need to focus upon and see if we can reduce this burden of disability uh, that is uh, rising by the very minute now prevalence of hearing loss is quite a bit in india uh, even though the world statistics you know kind of published this as about 1 to 2 for 1000 live births in india it is about 5 to 6 per 1000 live births and this is i think realistically even more for the simple reason of our age old traditions of what we call endogamy which is marrying within the same caste within the same subcaste which leads to the breeding of a lot of genetic issues as far as hearing loss is concerned so we definitely have a very high prevalence of congenital hearing loss in our country uh, we have definitely much more than 3.8 million deaf children right now these statistics are very very old and we haven't had a recent um, census which has really given us an exact figure after this particular study that was done by kapoor and kabra uh, so we are looking at about 30000 children being born every year some 
The thing that worries us as clinicians is that in India still, the average age of diagnosis of hearing loss is about 24 to 36 months. And that is something that is still a very worrying factor. Why is that such a worrying factor for us as clinicians? This was a study that was done years ago um, in the United States of America at the Boys Town National Hospital, where they looked at about 129 deaf and um, hard of hearing children. What they looked at was those children, and that is in green, who were diagnosed earlier than six months of gestational age. And the red was those children that were identified more than six months of gestational age. And what we can see is that the ones that were diagnosed earlier, that is less than six months, they caught up with the age-related um, you know, language that was anticipated. The red ones, even though they were diagnosed only just a little more than six months, they never really caught up as to what was expected with them in terms of language development. So as we can see from the study that Early diagnosis is really important. That means it should be even earlier than six months. And why is that so important? Because when we look at the hearing brain, it has a lot of stuff. It has almost something like 100 billion cells which contribute to it. We have about 10 raised to the power of 15 neural uh, synapses. And there are about one like the hearing brain. What is it that sort of affects the development of the hearing brain? And there are basically three things. One, of course, is genetics, because that is what's going to determine how the sinuses are formed, what is the plasticity of the brain. The other thing is what is the environmental influence that the child is growing up in? Does he get enough of stimulation, which helps uh, brain plasticity? And third, most important, is what is happening during the critical periods of brain development. Now in genetics of hearing loss, and this is a topic by itself, we know today that about 50 to 60% of hearing loss in children is due to genetic causes. There have been numerous studies done in India. Uh, uh, we did one with Komadi Godbole a couple of years back and that publication is out there. And there's a lot of stuff that's even come out from Ames Delhi, from their pediatric department. And we've seen here that about 70% of these are non-syndromic, 30% are syndromic, out of which 75 to 80% will be autism or recessive. That means they will be born to parents who are absolutely normal. And this is the one that is really something that we need to look at and we need to do a lot more genetic um, studies. We have identified in our studies across India that the so-called gene that's been reported to be one of the biggest causes of deafness, which is the GJB6, uh, is not that common in India as in other places. And that is uh, the same with the studies that have come out of both India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So we need lots more work on the genetics to happen. But what is the critical period that I'm talking about? The critical period that I'm talking about is the first three years of life. And those of us who really are working with, you know, really babies in terms of the NICU, we know how much really impacts. The first three years of life are the most critical for speech and language development. Because by six months, if the child is hearing normally, he should be or she should be able to recognize most of the sounds of their native language. And this is a graph which just depicts this, looks a bit complicated, this graph, but all that I want you to focus upon, are uh, this is the age in months. This is the age in year. If you notice that the maximum synapses that are forming in a child's brain in terms of language, seeing and hearing, higher cognitive is all happening in this time. That is from about zero to two after which we start to see the synapses reduce so they will reach the other level. It is this area of the child's growth that we need to really look at and we need to take advantage of because if you use any sort of diagnosis and intervention in this time, that's when the best benefit is going to happen. There is always a big balance of power between the auditory and the visual cortex. 
if between the first three years of life, we do not use that part of the brain that was designated for audition, which is the temporal lobe, we are going to lose it because the vision will take over. And this will happen irrespective of, you know, whether you and I intervene at the age of six or seven. And that is why most children, when you intervene later, have already become lip readers and their acquiring of speech and language if diagnosed late is never as good as if you had picked them up earlier. So when we are looking at the critical period of language acquisition, seven, not beyond that, out of which in the first three years, if we are able to diagnose, that's optimal and best for intervention. Beyond that, it's suitable. The child will do better than what the child is doing now. But will the child be able to compare or match his age-related peers not happening? So between three to seven, definitely some gain, but not what we could have given the child if we had intervened much earlier. And beyond the age of seven, the outcomes are very, very variable. And there are a lot of other factors that will influence how the child will develop in terms of his language skills. So we are looking now at diagnosing this hearing impairment as soon as possible. And that's going to be possible if we start neonatal hearing screening. And there are three things that we can do. We can either screen all the babies that are born in our country, a big task of looks easy, it has its own challenges. We can only screen those babies that present with high risk factors, which I will talk about in a subsequent slide. Or we can do what's called opportunistic screening. Opportunistic screening is when the parent comes to us and raises some concerns that, oh, my child may not be hearing properly, that we will think about doing a hearing screening. Now, when we look at the age of diagnosis, if we do universal hearing screening, we are able to diagnose children with a hearing problem as early as about eight months. If you're only going to do high-risk screening, then you're diagnosing hearing loss by the time the child is about 16 months. And if you're waiting for a parent to come back to us with some sort of concerns, it's almost two years of age. So obviously, what and we all have to work towards is developing universal neural screening in our environments that we work in. When we look at universal hearing screening, what we have to do is you are aiming to give these children the same linguistic and communicative competence as any other child that's born in this country. It's important that if you don't do this now, they don't do very well in school, and thereby then obviously chances of higher education, employment, all that goes down. What is the rule that we follow? And JCIH, that's the Joint Committee of Infant Hearing, proposed very far back into the 136 rule, which was that you screen the child at birth, maximum up to about a month, confirm the diagnosis by about three months of gestational age. And I have put this gestational age over here because a lot of pediatricians refer children to us at three months from the day that they were born. I would request you to remember that the three months starts from the day that the child was expected to be born and not from the day that the child was actually born. And this is very important because the tests for evaluation depend a lot on neural myelination. And remember that the myelination is not going to be when the child came into the world, but depending on what is the age of the child. So the gestational age, that means from the day that the child was expected to be born is what you calculate. And we intervene, that means we intervene with some sort of a device or some other measures, hopefully by six months of age. Now, this is what was proposed by GCIH, and I'm happy to say that in Kenya, we were able to incorporate this for quite a few years. And now what GCIH has said in 2019, that for those places that have managed to do the 136, we are trying to push now for the 123 rule, which is now we are screening the babies as early as one month, we are doing a complete diagnostic evaluation by two months of gestational age, and we are hoping to intervene by three months of gestational age. So we are now trying to even diagnose them much earlier than what we were doing a couple of years back. 
Now, what are these high risk babies that I were talking about? This is a list which all pediatricians know, and I'm not going to spend too much time about this, but it's important to remember that when you look at the factors that are high risk for hearing loss, these are the same factors that are very high risk for the children developing additional disabilities. And the challenge that we have in the institute that I work in is that most of the babies that we have don't only have hearing impairment, but they invariably come with a lot of additional disabilities, cerebral palsy, learning disabilities, and that is bound to happen. As our neonatal care improves, we are doing something whereby we save a life, but sometimes we lose a year. So there is a gain um, and a loss, and it's sometimes a very difficult decision to make. It's sometimes, um, you know, it's a very ethical issue, but sometimes you really question the, the value of, uh, you know, bringing these young kids out and what is it that we are really giving them with, but that's a topic for another discussion and another debate. So most of these children will have additional disabilities. Um, and the one that we see commonly is cerebral uh, palsy. For every high-risk baby, just doing neonatal screening with either OAE or AABR is not enough. All children with a high risk have to undergo a detailed audiological evaluation. That means a screening and a BERA. And this is because most of them will have a condition which is called auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. That means they will have a hearing problem and they pass the screening. So if you were just to look at screening, these kids will pass, they will fall out of your vision. You will not be focusing on them. And then we can have issues. So infants who pass... So infants who pass the hearing screening test and have at least one risk factor, this is now a recommendation by the JCIH, have to undergo a diagnostic ideological evaluation by two to three years, irrespective of the fact whether they have passed the screening, whether the parents have any observational concerns or whether the pediatrician has a concern, a detailed evaluation should be done by the time the child is two years. Some more recommendations that came out of the new JCIS guidelines was that any NICU baby admitted to greater than five means this may be admitted for observation. You haven't given the kid any antibiotics. There are none of the other risk factors. They also will undergo a detailed um, hearing evaluation, which includes both the screening and, and BERA. Any child who has not passed uh, a screening has to be referred directly to an audiologist for rescreening. Uh, and always, of course, this is already done. It's just a recommendation put on table that both years always have to be tested. Even if one has passed and the other has failed, when the child is evaluated, both years will always be evaluated. If for any reason the child is discharged, he passed the screening, but he gets readmitted into the NICU, we start afresh. That means it is taken as another admission and another scaring uh, screening procedure, even if the child passed the screening at the first admission. And the reason we see this is because you have to keep in mind that all these high-risk children, the chances of developing hearing impairment increase from about 5% to as high as 13% over the next two years of life. So we have to keep a follow-up on these babies and make sure that the parents are told this again and again that, look, even if you feel everything is normal, it's important. It's a checkbox that has got to be ticked that we will get a complete hearing evaluation done by the time it's about two years of age. And then we do say that, you know, it's important that every time they come in as a pediatrician, you just keep asking them and get a detailed eva audiological evaluation, if possible, done. Um, at least in the first three years of life, keep a good follow-up on these children. 
The question that I'm asked very commonly is which is the ideal screening modality? Uh, when you look at an ideal screening modality, you're going to look at one that has a failure rate of not more than five to seven percent, and it has the minimal referral rates. Now, both OE and ABR definitely have good specificity and sensitivity, but ABR is definitely more specific and it has a lower referral rate. The importance or the problem with ABR is definitely the expense of the instrument. Um, and it definitely needs a slightly more quieter environment than an OE when you're doing the AABR. However, when we look at studies, the best study uh, or the best results, uh, if uh, you use a combination of both OAE, OAE that's autoacoustic emissions and AABR, then the lowest referral rates are seen. At the KM Hospital in Pune, we've been using only OAE. And I must say, we do have a lot of false positives. So it's something uh, which is a matter of concern. And uh, you have to keep, uh, or you have to have a, a whole team that kind of looks into this and does a, a good follow up for these patients. Uh, the difference is an OAE, when you look at it as a screening modality, it only screens the cochlea. So it only tells you about how is the cochlea functioning, whereas the automated ABR actually does a screening of the entire functioning of the auditory pathway. So a combination of both these is definitely the best. However, like I said, economics and other issues definitely uh, play a big, uh, uh, a big role in our decision. Uh, I would request all of you, this is an excellent statement by the uh, Indian Academy of Pediatrics on Neonatal Hearing Screening. It's a beautifully written document, very, very concise. And I would urge all of us to go through it, both the ENTs, pediatricians, and the residents. Um, it's a very, very well-written document. Now, when is it that as a clinician, one should look at referring a patient to an ENT? And I think here is where we as clinicians have to really listen to what the parents are saying. And sometimes we've got to ask leading questions. If any of the parents gives us history that the child is constantly pulling the ear, there are repeated ear infections, the parent says, you know, sometimes he listens to me, sometimes he doesn't. I think he's more interested in playing with his toys. And that's a parent trying to maybe, you know, I would say belittle the problem. Or, or maybe, you know, in denial that really the kid has a problem. If the parent tells me this, I always tell the parent, look, let's just do the test. At the most, what will happen? It will be that the test is normal, but at least we won't feel that we missed out something. If the TV volume that the child is listening to is definitely louder than what the parent is comfortable with, if he's constantly asking the parent to repeat, what, Kai? then this is something of concern. While sitting, and this was something which was very well said when Dr. Jai Kelker spoke about the refraction, that if they, you know, she said if the child is looking the same way, if the child is constantly turning one year forward, then obviously it's a matter of concern. A fall in academic performance has to be taken very, very seriously. And that sometimes is the first sign. The child comes home. He's not writing his homework. The teacher is saying the child's not paying attention in class. Don't think that there is something wrong with the child. I'm not hearing. So this is something very, very important. If the child is speaking louder, if the child, and especially today now with the pandemic, with most of us wearing masks, if you're noticing that the child now has dropped in communication because they're losing the visual cues, then that may be another sign. And most importantly, as a clinician and as a parent, if there is a suspicion and the mother always knows, when you go back to the history and you ask the mother in isolation without the rest of the family members present and you ask her, did you suspect your child had a problem? She always knows that there's a problem. So listen to the mother because she has picked up that there may be something wrong with my child. The one thing that one must remember that when a child is referred for a hearing assessment, please remember that it takes time, patience, and a lot of expertise. Pediatric audiology is not everyone's ball game. It sometimes will take us multiple sessions before the audiologist will be able to give me a good hearing evaluation. So do not expect that when you refer a patient for a hearing evaluation, 
this patient is from out of station. I'm sending him today for a hearing test. I want a report in two hours. Not happening. It all depends a lot on what the child's mood is. Is the child cognitively there? Uh, you know, what is the mental status of the child? So please leave it to the specialist to decide um, as to how much time that test will take. So this is something that I would really urge you as clinicians to remember that this is not something that can happen immediately. The test that one would have impairment would be basically or broadly classified into three. We definitely want an audiology and a speech and language assessment. The important thing that I want is the development question. What is the development of the child? We hear, we speak, we everything with our brains. If my ear is perfect, but my brain is not able to process the sound, my brain is not able to process speech and language, the problem is not here, the problem is here. So with a child's evaluation, with hearing, I always want what's happening to the child developmentally. And that's where the role of the developmental pediatricians is extremely important when we are evaluating children with hearing impairment. And of course, imaging, but that's again like a topic for another day. The audiological tests that we have are a lot. They depend on what is the pathology that I'm expecting. The second thing is what is the age of the child? If the age of the child is a toddler, where I'm not going to really get any responses from a child, I'm looking at the first three tests. If it's a slightly older kid and we are able now to get visual reinforced audiometry and behavioral response audiometry at KM for even children as old as six months of age. So this is something that, like I said, takes time. They might get the response of one frequency today and they might call the child back for another frequency tomorrow. But remember, these are better tests than brain evoked response audiometry. Somehow there's this feeling in most pediatricians' mind that BERA is a test and the gold standard for hearing. Let me remove a myth. BERA is not a test of hearing. BERA is a test of neural integrity. All that BERA tells me is that the neurons from the periphery to the central auditory system are working. But a test of hearing is further down. The visual reinforced audiometry, the behavioral response audiometry, and the pure tone audiometry, these are tests for hearing. So do not refer patients for BERA if you're thinking hearing evaluation is needed. Just write hearing evaluation and leave it to the audiologist to decide which is the test that he thinks is specific. These are the other tests that we will always make the children undergo, their language and speech tests. So who decides? The professional will decide which is the test to be done. Depending on the, depending on what the child is like, I might want to do a behavioral audiometry, but if this child has ADHD, he has other issues where he's not able to sit, then I might change and say, okay, I need to go back and do a better and an SSR. So that will depend. And remember, sometimes it's not just one test. There are multiple tests which are done because each test is going to give me information about a different part of the year. Now, based on the test, we will classify the amount of hearing loss, um, you know, as either mild, moderate, or severe, or profound. And what the test will also tell me is which part of the year is affected. Is it something which is happening here? This fortunately is visible to all of us as clinicians. Is there a pathology in the middle year, or is there a pathology in the inner year? So the test will tell me what is, firstly, is there a problem? Two, what is the degree of the problem? Three, what is the site of the problem? Once all this is done, then now we can plan what is the options that we have for the child. It could be medical treatment, it could be a surgical treatment, and if none of the above two are applicable to that particular pathology, then we are looking at giving the child assistive listening devices like hearing aids, cochlear implants, or bone conduction devices. Today in the panel, we intend to cover the first two, so I'm going to really talk just about the assistive listening devices. Whatever may be the treatment option that I or any other ENT surgeon chooses for this child, the aim of that treatment has to be to get the child's hearing into what we call the speech banana. If I don't get the hearing into the speech banana, the child's language is not going to develop because all language falls here. 
And today we are being more precise and we are saying not just the speech banana, we want the child's hearing to come into what we call the speech string bean so that the child is even able to hear soft speech. Incidental learning, which is the best way to develop speech and language is happening when a child is doing something, but there are parents talking on the side and the child is able to hear that soft speech. He's picking up speech, he's picking up language and the best will happen if they hear soft speech. And that will happen if we aim to put the hearing into the string bean area. So what we look at in terms of assistive hearing devices is if a child presents with mild to moderately uh, severe hearing loss, we are looking at giving the child hearing aids. But if the child is severe to profound hearing loss, then we are looking at cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are not the first option for any person. It's always the hearing aid, which is the first option. And it's only when the hearing aid is not able to give that person benefit that we will think about doing a cochlear implant. The cochlear implantation program cannot run within an individual. It is a whole team that works. And this is the team that we have now at KEM that works with cochlear implantation. And each one of them would be looking at a different aspect not just a surgeon. Now, this is just to tell you how a cochlear implant really works. This is normal hearing, that's the organ of corti, and we get a stimulation of the spiral ganglion near cells in a normal hearing. In a person who has sensory hearing loss, you're getting movement of the basilar membrane, but there are no hair cells. And because there are no hair cells, there is no stimulation of the spiral ganglion. And that's where the cochlear implant comes in. The cochlear implant directly will stimulate the spiral ganglion hair cells, thereby bypassing this part which is defective. So that's why a cochlear implant is beneficial to those people in whom hearing aids don't work. Because if my hair cells are very, very few, then even if I give you the best of the hearing aids, I'm not going to be able to stimulate the nerves. As I said, the evaluation is done by a team and it's not just the ENT and the audiological services. We have the role of the child psychologist, the development of pediatrician, a geneticist who will be working with the genetic aspect of the hearing loss, a social worker. She has got to look at the part of the program whereby the sustainability of the device has to be looked at, whether this family can sustain the device for the rest of the kid's life. And of course, last but not the least, most important is the role of the radiologist. The reason why we have to look at early diagnosis is also because all of us want to aim to put these children into normal schools. And if we are able to implant children less than two years of age, we are looking at about 90% of them entering mainstream education. Even if you implant them later, which is two to four years, it's not that they're not doing well, but the percentage of entering mainstream education goes down. This is a big challenge in our country, which definitely lacks special educators and special schools. So we have to really aim at getting these children into mainstream education so that they can get the best opportunities. This is just a rough description. And I'm proud to say that now in KM, the white is what you need to look at. We are now implanting more and more children less than five years. The goal still is to get them less than two years. And that's something that we are still working at. But at least I'm happy to say that when we look at the numbers that we have, we have managed to implant them uh, quite a few children less than five years of age. As of date, we have about 554 implantees. And the good thing is that about 93% of our kids are going to mainstream school. We have 7% who are not going to mainstream schools. They're going to special schools. And some of these are children who have a lot of additional disabilities like associated, uh, you know, like the ushers who have associated visual problems. We have a lot of children with learning disabilities and cerebral palsy. And these are not able to definitely go into mainstream um, education. Lastly, I'll just briefly mention something about Baha, which is the bone conduction hearing aid. The principle of Baha basically works on the fact that even if I have one ear which is totally defective and I can give this Baha device to this child on this ear, they are able to utilize the hearing from the other ear and thereby get an awareness of sound that's happening from this point of view. 
What is it in pediatrics where these children may need a Baha? And the one that I would say is most important is the oral atresia or the anosia or microtia, where the outer ear is not well formed. This is usually associated with anomalies in the middle ear. Fortunately, the inner ear is usually normal, and these kids benefit a lot with the Baha. The other one are the syndromic hearing losses, the treacher collins, the golden heart, and down, whereby these children, because of their multiple syndromic issues and facial anomalies, uh, they have a lot of hearing issues. They have a lot of in, uh, tendency to develop repeated And these kids do also very well with the Baha. Congenital unilateral sense neural loss is a very debatable topic in our country. I wouldn't really promote it. But today, yes, across the world, this is becoming a, a big indication for Baha. Uh, the... The points remain the same. The only problem is the Baha as a surgery cannot be done till the child has a skull thickness of at least 2.5 millimeters. So since we know that there is a critical period for a language acquisition, we give these children initially something called a Baha soft band. They wear it like a band here. I have a picture further to show it to you. Then as they grow bigger, they go into a Baha sound arc. And finally, when we get enough of the skull vein, uh, skull bone thickness, we are able to put in an implant. And this is what the soft band looks like. Uh, this is especially in Downs, we are seeing that, yes, they improve a lot after receiving um, the Baha soft band. And this can be put in right when they are babies. Uh, so it's fitting is possible right from infancy. Um, it can be moved, you know, to adjust so that the pressure is not there. You can use it by and basically you're buying time. So you cannot deny the child sound because you want the child to develop speech and language, but at the same time, you can't do the surgery now. So the soft band is that middle bridge till we can do uh, the surgery. And um, like we said, you have to wait till the bone is about 2.5 millimeters uh, thick. I think to end uh, my take home message to all clinicians really would be that if there is a problem, let's not push it uh, under the carpet. Let's not say, you know, let's wait. Um, the father spoke later, so maybe the child will speak later. If there is concern, if there is anything that comes in from the parents, early intention has to be done because the goal that all of us have is not just hearing. We've got to make these children communicatively competent. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. It was a highly educative presentation. Uh, now we will move on to our next topic, uh, nasty nose and persistent symptoms. Can you see my screen? No, not yet. Yeah, now it's seen. Yes. Uh, Dr. Abhijit Mantri, he is a consultant ENT at Mantri Hospital and Sanjeevan Hospital Pune. Uh, he is a gold medalist for surgical faculty, University of Pune. He has performed the first successful thyroplasty in Pune. He has invented a gauge to measure implant size in thyroplasty. He is a faculty for various workshops. He is presently offering free consultations and surgeries for HIV-affected orphans. He has participated in several free ENT checkup camps in rural areas. Over to Dr. Abhijit Mantri, sir. So can we share my screen? Yeah, 
सर उज्ज्वला मैम तुम तो शेयरिंग स्क्रीन स्टॉप करा it is stopped yeah mantri sir you can go to your presentation and then share it yeah i am already on the presentation okay now you can share the screen is my screen visible to you no not yet it will take some time few seconds hmm started abhijit we started seeing yeah, yeah. okay so uh, uh, i thank all of you for inviting me for this session and uh, after an elaborate session by dr neeram vaid i'm just going to share my uh, inputs on this dusty nose in fact uh, most of the pediatric copd uh, has a lot of uh, patients with upper respiratory tract infection and uh, you people might be seeing a lot more patients than i see, i see For the nasty nose. So I'll just share my inputs about uh, what we are doing in ENT practice. So this is what the nasty nose would look like, and uh, if you can see, there's a crease here on the nose, and typically uh, it has been described for uh, allergic rhinitis conditions. But uh, anyone who has got a chronic uh, nasal condition with a dripping nose is bound to develop this crease. so with nasty nasty nose i uh, presume we would be considering uh, persistent or recurrent nasal symptoms such as nasal discharge nasal obstruction sneezing mouth breathing and snoring and we would uh, grossly have a differential diagnosis as uh, allergic rhinitis adenoids a deviated nasal septum uh, chronic uh, infective rhinosinusitis and then rarely we have conditions like coronal atresia and impact, impacted foreign body in the nose you have nasal masses which could be benign such as polyps and malignant tumors and maybe uh, cartagena syndrome so a good history taking is uh, important and uh, you could arrive at your diagnosis just by the history itself most of the times and uh, a few points which you could uh, ask in the history are about the type of the discharge so if you have a watery discharge or a mucoid discharge or a mucoperitoneal discharge the watery one usually a sign of allergic rhinitis mucoid would be secondary to some obstruction in the nose and mucoperitoneal of course would be uh, secondary to the obstruction and superadded bacterial infection you ask for associated symptoms and you could get a hint to your diagnosis so if a patient has got associated skin allergies or uh, itching in the eyes uh, there's an, there has been a history of uh, recurrent nebulization for the child again the symptoms would go uh, in favor of an allergic condition uh, and response to treatment also so uh, patients with allergy uh, typically would be saying that they go to the doctor they take t- treatment and feel better and the moment the treatment is stopped they uh, start having the symptoms again so uh, uh, every treatment for the ch- child with upper respiratory tract infection has some antihistamine or the other and that is why they respond well to the anti allergic treatment and the moment the uh, the anti allergic treatment is stopped the symptoms are bound to resume you ask for unilateral or bilateral uh, discharge so uh, bilateral discharge usually like in conditions like adenoids or in allergic rhinitis but a unilateral would then point either towards uh, a polyp in the nose or a, a foreign body there 
or sinusite is restricted to one side. Again, family history. So allergies are common in families and a positive family history uh, would again help you clinch diagnosis. So uh, we go to the investigation. Investigation would uh, be your nasal e examination and endoscopy and basics like uh, hemogram, uh, the Ig levels for your uh, uh, allergies, your X-ray skull lateral view. So only role of uh, uh, X-ray in this nasal conditions, I think, is uh, meant for uh, checking on the adenoids. Apart from that, the X-ray is not a very uh, useful uh, tool. A CT scan is a better tool, and uh, of course, you would do a biopsy if you are suspecting a tumor. So this is what the X-ray is. Uh, uh, it is. It has been done for the adenoids, and you can see this part, which is the airway, which has narrowed significantly, and is causing symptoms. So I think this is the only place where an X-ray has a role. This is a much better uh, tool. Uh, for investigation, this is a CT scan of the paranasal sinuses and which shows significant involvement of the uh, and, and unilateral involvement of the maxillary sinuses, the ethmoids also coming into the nose. And we have some pictures of nasal endoscopy. So nasal endoscopy can be done easily in the as an OPD procedure. And a lot of children do allow using the endoscope. So uh, what we do is we ask them to spray the nose with an decongestant, uh, make them wait in the OPD for some and the consulting for some time and uh, get them back into the OPD and do the endoscopy. Hardly takes about 10-15 uh, minutes of spraying the decongestant, but then we get pictures like these. So this is uh, where you have a polyp with chronic rhinocytis in a child. This is a grossly deviated nasal septum. These are the adenoids which are seen on endoscopy. This again is a deviated nasal septum with a big spur and causing significant symptoms. This is a polyp which is just seen on a plain uh, nasal endoscopy. So having uh, uh, diagnosed your condition, uh, we just go ahead with uh, the treatment. So we go stepwise and uh, in uh, adenoids, uh, just there's a big role of conservative management also. And uh, a lot of patients who are referred to me for adenoidectomy, I usually advise them to uh, start exercising regularly if they are not exercising. Uh, start the use of uh, internasal corticosteroid sprays, take steam regularly. And, uh, uh, and then I ask them to maintain a chart wherein they mention the days on which they have been worse with uh, rhinitis and nasal blockage and the days where uh, the symptoms have reduced. And we observe for a month or two months. And if we see positive uh, progress and the symptoms going down significantly, yes, the, the surgery can definitely be uh, avoided. And uh, but in uh, children, where the symptoms are significant and they really come up with uh, uh, significant apneic spells, it is better not to wait and go ahead and uh, operate right away. The surgery can either be a conventional surgery where we do uh, cure it out of the adenoids and uh, uh, it's a blind procedure with sort of bleeding and uh, difficult to know whether the adenoids have been completely removed or not whether there is any uh, damage to the adjacent structures. And so the present uh, treatment for an adenoidectomy, uh, for adenoids would be doing a endoscopic assisted a debrider or a coblator uh, surgery. So I'll just try to show you. This is a coblator surgery being done for an adenoid. And uh, you can see the probe is inside the nasopharynx and it is gently removing the adenoid. You just have to use it like a brush and uh, move it on the surface. Absolutely bloodless. Uh, moment you see some bleeding, you can immediately 
coagulate the we, it, we are not seeing any videos are you not yeah no not it seen. is on my screen but we are not seeing okay no video no any picture sorry out of the ppt and then share the video separately okay no sir so you have to close i think i i think my screen now we are seeing your screen but ppt slide is there only okay you just seeing the ppt slide yet okay yeah. okay 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 is you okay just hold on no i have to come out of the ppt so I'll stop the slide show okay yo otherwise at the end of your uh, yeah maybe yeah we could do that we could do that we can go back to uh, and video. we can go and fine we could continue with the same presentation just uh, before that uh, it is that uh, click to add text so you can yeah. get to your right, right 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 okay so uh, for treatment of allergic rhinitis we have uh, uh, oral anti allergic medication along with intranasal uh, corticosteroids so typically when the patient comes with significant symptoms uh, we start them both mm -hmm. on uh, oral antihistamines maybe uh, st uh, oral steroids also if there are significant significant symptoms and intranasal corticosteroids so i think the mainstay of treatment uh, should be uh, intranasal corticosteroids with uh hardly any side effects uh, for using the medication and they can be used year long so uh, it is important for you to stress to the uh, to the parents that the uh, steroids have to be continued the uh, nasal steroids for uh, as a maintenance dose and the moment they stop the uh, intranasal steroids the symptoms are going to recur of course they can be uh, used Uh, depending on whether the condition is seasonal or perennial so for a perennial it would be year long and seasonal you can use the medication only when uh, the patient has symptoms and there's a the steroids have a uh, preventive role so if the patient comes to you in a acute condition and if you give you if you give intranasal steroids it is not going to help because the all the medications is going to flow out with the secretions so at that particular time probably giving an oral antihistamine along with the steroids would be a, a helpful thing and uh, recently uh, a lot of people have been doing allergy testing and uh, desensitization so uh, i know a few pediatricians were doing that in a large scale now and uh, it uh, does help uh, significantly and i have been referring patients to them for uh, uh, the allergy testing and for desensitization with obviously good results and uh, uh, and we have this uh, deviated nasal septum so uh, there is a lot of skepticism about whether uh, the surgery should be offered to the child or not but uh, it should not be a bar for surgery if the symptoms are significant and if you ruled out all other causes uh, for nasal obstruction it is uh, advisable to go in uh, for surgery and uh, endoscopic or endoscopic assisted surgery is uh, recommended to give uh, better results and yes it does give excellent results in uh, properly selected cases and you have this uh, polyps and uh, chronic sinusitis 
in the end. So again, endoscope surgery has uh, revolutionized treatment for uh, chronic sinusitis and for polyps. It is a precise surgery. It's a faster surgery with less morbidity, less bleeding. And uh, most important is the surgery is, uh, as we call it, functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So it is a functional part, which is more important, which tries to preserve most of the normal mucosa and hence uh, the ciliary clearance is also maintained. The take home message would be uh, important uh, detailed history taking to actually uh, uh, get to the diagnosis. You need minimal and appropriate investigations for diagnosis. There is significant role of conservative management. And just in case surgery is needed, it's good to have advanced tools. I'll just try once more to see if I can show you that uh, video. Can you view it now? Is it no, visible now? Still not. Okay. I think you have to first close down the PPT. Okay. Video is in your presentation only, or it, uh, it's a different? No, it's a different one. So stop sharing this, and then you have to go to that video and then uh, start sharing. So it's sorry, okay. sorry. I will repeat. You have to stop sharing this. You have to okay. go to okay. Okay. that video and then share it. Is it working? No, I'm just trying to get there. Okay. Otherwise, you can actually share the screen. And in that, when you share the screen, you have a choice which screen you have to share. In that, uh, you can choose that video. Okay. Another Now it's... Okay, can you see yeah, this now? Yeah. You will share now. Fine. So this is how the coblator works. And uh, this is the wand, which is uh, being used on the adenoids. And if you see, it's a completely bloodless surgery. The adenoids are being removed uh, in layers. You're not seeing it. You have to start it. Start it. I, okay. Because I can see it on my screen. I, I think it's some delay is there. Usually some 30, 40 second delay should be there. Are you seeing it now? Not yet. Sorry? Still not. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not seen? No, not it. Okay. Okay. Should we skip this then? Yeah. Otherwise, you can mail it to uh, IAP or Siddha. Okay. Can you he help us? Okay. We'll skip for now. Yeah, we'll skip this. So, uh... That's it. So that that's the end of my lecture, actually. Yeah. Stop sharing. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. I just want to know one thing: Is there any role of preprobiotics in allergic rhinitis? 
I don't think so. There is any role of preprobiotics in allergic rhinitis. Oh, I am not some aware MRs, of uh, some MRs promote some uh, some strain of lactobacillus. I know, I know. They've been to me yeah. too, but uh, I am not really aware of the role of uh, lactobacillus. Okay. How long we can give uh, medications for the yes. particularly if allergic or if continuous discharge, nasal discharge? Yeah. So, uh, for an allergic uh, rhinitis, you could give uh, intranasal corticosteroids for years together. And uh, as uh, the child is uh, exposed to the allergen, the child is going to keep on having symptoms. So, uh, either you have to stop uh, the child getting exposed to the allergen or you uh, the child undergoes desensitization or then keeps on using the spray. And it's uh, known to be safe for children and can be used for years together. It does not get absorbed in the uh, body. It works mostly in the nose. So no uh, side effects as such. Which is better, Mometasone? I think I've used both Mometasone and Fruticasone. So both okay. seem to be giving uh, good results. Particularly pediatric, I'm asking. Yeah, both, even for pediatrics. So okay. I've used both actually. Okay. okay. Okay, sir, you have to stop sharing. Yes, so stop sharing the screen now. Stop sharing. Abhijit. Yeah. Okay, I'll just... Do you have any role of uh, Montelukast in allergic rhinitis? Uh, I think I, uh, we will uh, reserve these all questions for panel discussion. Yeah, that will be better. No problem. Yeah. Okay, we will move on to panel discussion on ENT problems now. Uh, the moderator is Dr. Lalit Kumar Dhoka. He is consulting pediatrician and neonatologist. He is director at uh, Pritam Children's Hospital Bosri. He is founder director at Mimbri Jinswood Institute of Pediatrics. He is treasurer IMA PCB. He is joint treasurer at PCDA. He is awarded by Lions Club International for Child Welfare Work and Work for Deprived Children in last 13 years. He is a convener of, of CME on Pediatric Endocrinology by IMA, PCB and PCDA two years ago. Over to Dr. Lalit Kumar Yeah, Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Jola, Madam. Uh, thank you, IAP Pune, for giving me opportunity for moderating this ENT session. Uh, I will share my screen. Are you seeing my screen, sir? No, Dhoka, sir, is starting. Just now it is browsing only. No, yeah, yeah. 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 You can will, have the first go to the Yeah, slideshow. Hmm. Yeah. Are you okay. seeing yeah, a yeah, big, big screen? Yeah, yeah, it's clean. No problem. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, now we are starting panel discussion on ENT practice. The panelists we have are Dr. Neelam Ved, Dr. Ravindra Sardesai, and Dr. Abhijit Mantri. Uh, recently, Ujola Madam has introduced Ved Madam. We have been very uh, happy to have Ved Madam with us for sharing this all panel discussions. We know. Her work in cochlear implant is huge and tremendous. Thank you, madam, for joining. We have Dr. Abhijit Mantri. We have just now delivered lecture on nasty nodes. He's a good friend of mine and his batchmate or classmate of me. And we are friends since last 30 years. Dr. Ravindra Sardesai. Yeah, he's a consulting ENT and skull-based surgeon. Working at working as an ENT consultant in Jahangir and Jupiter Hospital. Thank you, Sir Desai, sir, for joining panel discussion. We'll start panel discussion right away. Uh, the questions which we have from our colleague pediatricians, 
the questions on year we will start first uh, sir sir desai sir how yeah. to differentiate serous otitis media from purulent otitis media in a clinical setting of pediatrics does it does this distinction is really needed kindly uh, share some light on this can you see me sir desai sir are you on the board yeah yeah i am on the board can you hear me yeah 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 your video should be on sir yeah just one moment video on and uh, yeah, please okay, voice fine. make little louder sir now can you hear me yeah yeah little yeah. louder if it is possible little louder um is there a way to close to your mic okay can you hear me now yes sir okay um first uh, let me thank iip to uh, for this invitation for the panel discussion and it's a very interesting uh, panel discussion it should be because uh, we have stalwarts like nilam void and abhijit mantri with us um, to addressing the first question how to differentiate serious otitis media from purulent otitis media um the basically purulent otitis media and serious otitis media has a major difference and that is there is no discharge in serious otitis media otoria is not there. so if yes. there is otoria you are not dealing with uh, um, serious otitis media serious otitis media is essentially effusion of fluid behind the intact tympanic membrane so the patient does not really present with otoria he will be presenting with uh symptoms basically of deafness which neelam already has described in details but wh what i would suggest is that uh, these children have um, mild to moderate hearing losses which are very often missed and um, they will always present most of times with attention deficit attention deficit is always a corollary to deafness and many times even because of the parents are really not liking to um Uh, uh, liking to brand their child as deaf, they will always say that he is not putting attention. But what we can observe, as has been rightly described already, that any attention deficit, as EV um, uh, volume is loud, scholastic difficulties, child is falling back in his educational achievements, etc., all these symptoms which uh, indicate towards deafness. Uh, first thing which you should look at is the ear. Um, as i am uh, uh, always saying that uh, most of the people who practice uh, in general practice or pediatrics have otoscopes and otoscope is an excellent instrument to diagnose these conditions if you know the condition and if you have seen enough but i personally feel tuning fork is a much better instrument because tuning fork will tell you about conductive deafness by simple renal test or webers test and that will get you an idea whether the child is suffering from deafness so that is the primary difference between serous otitis media and purulent otitis media yeah uh, every pediatrician should have otoscope as per your uh, opinion sir not really what i personally feel is tuning fork is a much better instrument than otoscope because otoscope essentially requires um cleaning ability of the ear canal and in a busy opd without the required equipment cleaning of the ear in a child who is not very cooperative is a difficult job unless we nowadays are cleaning ears with suction and microscope to make a exact diagnosis which is obviously not possible in a pediatric practice so in a pediatric practice um, otoscope will give you diagnosis of a condition like serous otitis media because there is no discharge and you can easily peep inside but then in case of a child who is having a active discharge it is difficult to clean the discharge completely to expose the tympanic membrane and look at the tympanic membrane and make a diagnosis so i think it is difficult to um, i don't know uh, what what would be the general opinion but um, otoscope is will give you a general idea of the condition but especially as far as serous otitis media is concerned i think tuning fork is a much better instrument <laughs> how to diagnose with tuning fork sir can you again elaborate yeah in a child who is about 4 years old will always respond adequately to tuning fork test and if you have a suspicious that there is one side ear has a serous otitis media obviously webers test will lateralize to that side you will get a renal negative on that side that suggests us that there is a conductive loss and then you can always send a child for audiological examination serous otitis media is not an acute condition it doesn't present with pain 
so the child would be brought to you after the serious otitis media symptoms are there for a long time so if the parents bring a child to you thinking that he may be having a deafness which is not like a sensory neural deafness where the symptoms and signs would be very obvious but it's a telltale sign of lack of attention lack of um, vocabulary Voca vocabulary is not developing as quickly as should be this will obviously happen in a bilateral serious otitis media which is a common condition especially in a child who is having a uh, recurrent upper respiratory tract infections who is having um, adenoids especially adenoids is the commonest cause for bilateral serous otitis media and if you get a bilateral conductive loss in a child then you can always suspect that he is having serous otitis media with an otoscope what you would look at you look at the eardrum and you may see a eardrum which is not shining you know uh, on a tympanic membrane you will always see in a normal anatomy a nice cone of light it's a shining light is shining because of particular position of the tympanic membrane in the external artery canal the light concentrates in the um, anterior inferior quadrant and gives a nice cone of light now if this cone of light is not present or it is broken or sometimes you may see a nice fluid level of the tympanic membrane there are bubbles behind the tympanic membrane if you ask the child to do valsalva sometimes you can see bubbles coming up there all these signs are of serious otitis and if the serious uh, if you see all these things and do then do there are two tests which are important in a child impedance audiometry will give you a very clear idea whether there is a serious otitis media because in the impedance audiometry gives you a flat uh, uh, a flat graph b type graph which is classical of serious otitis media and serious otitis media is not a single condition it is a spectrum of conditions which starts from what is called as effusion in the middle ear up to a what is called as a glue ear so the um, so the fluid which is in the middle ear if it goes on thickening then it will go from effusion to serous otitis media to secretory otitis media to glue ear and the fluid thickens the patient's hearing loss also goes on increasing this is not a this is not necessarily a progressive condition always it could be fluctuating condition the hearing loss may relate to uh, upper presence of upper respiratory tract infection so many times parents also complain that he cannot hear when he has got a bad cold or he has got a bad upper respiratory infection these are all signs of serious otitis media yeah. and of course if the child is old enough to respond to a pure tone audiometry then he will show conductive loss which is about say of the air bone gap 20 to 30 to sometimes 40 dB yes. so this is a condition uh, which can be easily diagnosed most important thing about serous otitis media is that if diagnosed at the right time it is a completely reversible condition with medications to begin with treating the upper respiratory tract infection effectively diagnosing adenoids and sometimes if required putting a grommet grommet insertion virtually reverses the hearing loss because of serous otitis media and beyond that the most important thing about serous otitis media is if the child is ignored for a long time serous otitis media can develop into a condition called unsafe otitis media which has kind of uh, which can have life threatening complications like meningitis and brain abscess so it's very important to diagnose serous otitis media and, and it's very good question because serous otitis media is very often uh, ignored by parents sometimes are not diagnosed at the primary practitioner level and if they are not diagnosed then basically if the child has a bilateral serous otitis media he can develop hearing loss which will affect his academic career and over the time if he develops what is called as a cholestatoma or unsafe otitis media then he is in for life threatening complications thank you sir desai sir uh, for throwing light on this serous otitis media which is a very common condition and is which should be looked in by the all the pediatrician or which should be kept in mind by all pediatricians and should be uh, should have high index of suspicion to diagnose and to refer to ant uh, i would ask i would like to ask dr abhijit mantri uh, recently mujhe sir desai sir has mentioned insertion of grommet or ventilation tubes for this serous otitis media when we have to take this decision to put ventilation tube when we should stop medication or believing on medic medications only and we, when we should put these ventilation tubes and actually pediatrician should when when refer to ent for this grommet insertion 
Abhijit. Yeah, so, uh, actually, uh, Sadesai sir has uh, covered most of this, uh, mainly uh, saying that the upper respiratory tract infection needs to be treated first. So, if you have given adequate treatment for the upper respiratory tract infection, and if you have got the uh, upper respiratory tract infection controlled completely, and in spite of that, the hearing loss persists, if you can see a fluid in the middle ear, if you have uh, no other cause for hearing loss like wax or any other uh, thing in the ear, I think it's better to go in for a grome. So typically we would wait for about uh, at least about four to six weeks on medical line of treatment, adequate steam inhalation, decongestant nasal drops, steroids, mucolytic agents, and uh, wait for this uh, serous uh, fluid to drain out. And failing this, yes, it is uh, advisable to go in for a uh, growing. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, just uh, out of these questions, when I, I will ask another question. While treating a recurrent or uh, treating URT infections, usually we face kids with nasal blockage or uh, some earache. Should we use decongestant drops routinely, like xylometazoline or oxymetazoline, which should be preferred? And uh, what is the judicious, how we should use judiciously? So I think there's no harm in using uh, uh, decongestant nasal drops. In fact, I do use them very frequently, uh, even the children. And uh, yes, judicious use would be not using them beyond 14 days at a stretch. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, next question I would, ask, I would like to ask to Ved, madam. Uh, recurrent otitis media. If a patient or if a, if a child comes with recurrent otitis media, what should we do? When should we call it as a recurrent? And what action should we take to avoid complications? Wait, madam, please. I think if uh, in your practice you're seeing a parent bringing a child, uh, you know, repeatedly, let's say almost every two or three months with history of ear discharge, uh, and you are giving this patient, uh, you know, your adequate conservative treatment, which would be antibiotics, drops, whatever. I would say, please take an opinion of an ENT. Uh, if a child has a recurrent uh, discharge from the ear, this is what I'm assuming when you're saying recurrent radius media, there's obviously something underlying there, which maybe we are missing. Uh, it could be nothing, but maybe just a simple perforation, or it could be something as, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Saldes, I mentioned it may be the cover for something more uh, un like an unsafe ear disease which is happening there. So recurrent otitis media, I personally believe that if you have seen a child, let's say about three or four times in one calendar year in your practice, then it would be a good idea to take the opinion of an ENT um, for that. Madam, uh, usually if a child comes with recurrent otitis media for two times also, we start a long duration of antibiotic course. Uh, do, what do what you suggest on this? I didn't get the question, Dr. Doka. The recurrent otitis for second or third time. Not mm -hmm. We will not wait for one year, whole one sure. year to have sure. three to four episodes. Sure. If he's getting within two, three months, two to three episodes, should we start a long-term prophylaxis antibiotics course for this recurrent otitis media? I, I want to know what the pathology is, Dr. Doka. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not just treating an infection. I need to know what is causing the infection. Um, so if you're telling me a child has recurrent otitis media, maybe the ear is just a presentation of something more else sinister, which is happening maybe in the nasopharynx. I don't know. So in my opinion, just giving the antibiotics to dry the ear without really knowing why is the ear discharging uh, would not be appropriate. So if a child is coming to us with repeated history of ear infections, then we need to maybe evaluate it more. Is there something like, uh, again, Dr. Sadis, I said, does the child have a, an underlying adenoid issue? Does the child have something else happening in the nose? Is there some sort of a tumor here? We don't know. So this may just be a presentation of something else. So yeah. not giving antibiotics till I know what is happening inside. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for inputs. Now we'll, I, I will ask uh, Dr. Sardesai, regarding treating uh, ear infections in pediatrics, what are the red flags which a pediatrician should follow? Uh, and at that red flags, we should 
start referring to ENT. Just mention few red flags for uh, take home as a take home message for ear infections. I, I take ear infection as ear discharge. Because every ear infection may not be a disease. We talked about serous otitis media. So there are two symptoms here. One is a ear discharge. Second is deafness. So we must consider both of them. And please understand that all the ear infective ear disease is basically through gestation. There are three ways a ear infection can come. One is the commonest, that is through gestation tube. Then second is through a existing perforation. And third is through blood. The other two are very, very rare. So the commonest one is gestation tube. So whenever you get an ear infection, please look at the nasopharynx, look at the upper respiratory tract. If there is a problem there, we need to treat that first and that will be an answer to the ear infection. Now, as far as red flags are considered, um, you know, what I would suggest is that uh, the ear infection, which is not settling down, which is Causing bad smell, there is a typical bad smell of unsafe ear disease, which is very, very familiar, very familiar to that. The ENT surgeons are very familiar to that. But then I don't know whether in a busy practice, this can be uh, understood or not. But in a unsafe otitis media, if that particular uh, bad smell is there, then you should directly refer the patient because you are dealing with a disease which can cause life-threatening complications, number one. Number two is, please look at the nose and the nasopharynx. Um, what you can do is you can always check the history whether the child is suffering from repeated upper respiratory infections, number one. Number two is whether the child is a mouth breather. Mouth breathing and it's a very important thing to go for an x-ray of the nasopharynx to find out if there are adenoids. Now, adenoids has become a very, very important subject because adenoids can cause bilateral ear infections, okay? And adenoids also cause multiple other problems like adenoid facies, then like uh, uh, dental uh, uh, problems, like uh, crowding of teeth, like uh, chronic mouth breathing causing problems. Now, um, can you show the picture which I had given you of the adenoids? See, uh, yeah, just, what that's what I'm you? searching, but I think uh, I have not added in this PPT. Anyway, so uh, you can remember the picture which Dr. Abhijit showed of the adenoids and you can see yeah. the lateral view of nasopharynx. And I have been requesting pediatricians also to do this so that you know that the real problem, because allergic rhinitis and adenoiditis are many times coexisting. And it becomes very difficult for a pediatrician to understand whatever the problem is happening is because of allergic rhinitis or maybe a deviated nasal septum or is it because of adenoids. Adenoids are sitting in the mouth of the eustachian tube, so they can cause ear infections very frequently. And what you can do is you can do a lateral view of nasopharynx to see if there are adenoids. And there is a very simple grading system of adenoids, and I request all pediatricians to grade the adenoids. Because the adenoid, uh, the nasopharyngeal cavity can be obstructed. It's a very simple grading system, 25%, 50%, 25% obstruction. And if there is persistent mouth breathing along with persistent food and uh, say grade three adenoids, then this is not going to respond to whatever you do, whatever long-term antibiotic you do, et cetera, because the child is going to need a surgery on the nasopharynx to remove adenoids. Now, um, the adenoid surgery, uh, the conventional adenoid surgery was just by curating, which was a completely blind surgery. And we never knew whether the adenoids were completely removed or not. Recently, Dr. Abhijit was trying to show the video and I hope it can be seen later on. Now we can do endoscopic adenoidectomy where you are having a very, very clear view of adenoids, the tubal part of the adenoids, and they can be effectively removed completely. So the results are excellent. And sometimes when there is a recurrent otitis media or a chronic otitis media, the real answer could be a good adenoid. And as I said, if the adenoids are graded by the primary care physician right from the beginning, then we know whether they are growing, whether they have been always big, whether the child needed surgery, because there is an obvious reluctance for, for surgery from the parents. So we need to know even the pediatrician as well as the ENT surgeon has to be on the same page as far as the diagnosis of adenoid is concerned. And if we both feel that uh, there is a grade 3 adenoid or grade 4 adenoid present, child is breathing my mouth, child is having bilateral recurrent ear infections or deafness, serous otitis media. Then what we need to do, as I said, grommet is just a relief of media. 
So bromate is not an answer to the serous or dietitian media. The answer would be adenoidectomy, adequately done adenoidectomy with a debrider or a publator and Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, even if we are looking for ear discharge, we should look for all the throat. We should definitely look for adenoids as per uh, Bijit has said, Ravindra, has, Ravindra Sardesai sir has said. And before uh, going or jumping to any other thing, we should rule out all these conditions so that ear infections can be tackled easily. Now, uh, we'll go to the nodes. Some Dr. questions Dr. On Dr. May, I, may I just make a comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, uh, on, you know, a lot of pediatricians, uh, when patients present to them with ear pain, they prescribe ear drops. Uh, could we, uh, as an ENT fraternity, request you not to? The reason being when you put these ear drops and you send them to us, uh, sometimes they are antibiotic ear drops and you know, the child then comes to us with maybe an associated fungal infection and automycosis as we call it. And then we are lost. We don't know what was the original issue that really happened. Uh, so can we just you know, abstain from prescribing ear drops um, that you know, patients believe if you put the ear drops, the pain will go. I mean, most of us know that we'll go with systemic medication. So this is just a request uh, to all pediatricians that when you, know, you get a call saying, my kid's ear is paining, please don't say put ear drops. Uh, just tell them to give a systemic painkiller. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, madam. Uh, we usually, all pediatricians follow this uh, rule that we never use any ear drops during these ear conditions as far as possible. And systemic painkiller should be used. This is a very good take-home message for all the pediatricians that ear drops should not be used as far as possible for any ear condition, especially painful ear conditions. Okay, madam. Yeah. Uh, the next question is. For a moment. Yes, sir. Yeah, as far as um, as far as the uh, red flags are concerned, I would suggest that uh, the discharge from the ear, if it is just a mucoid discharge, uh, sticky discharge, then most of the times it is safe for uh, But if the child is uh, having a um, bad smelling, foul smelling discharge, and especially with a blood stain. Blood stain always indicates granulations with a bone infection. So these patients should better be referred because they may have an encephalitis again with deadly complications. So hello. Uh, I would like uh, to throw light, uh, Vijit. Please, uh, can 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 you tell us encephalitis media and encephalitis media in a short? Okay, so uh, I think it has been covered, but I'll just going, I'm just going to repeat what Dr. Sadesai said. So if you have a mucoid kind of a discharge or a mucopurin discharge, presence of mucus means that the uh, there's a perforation, the tympanic membrane has been perforated, and that would usually be in a, a safe kind of uh, otitis media. So you look for mucus, you draw, pull out the uh, uh, ear, discharge. ear discharge on a earbud. And if you get a string, if you can make out the mucoid element, yes, it is a safe ear. And yes, foul smell is a, a big indicator of uh, unsafe ear. So a foul smelling discharge, which is non-mucoid, uh, definitely goes in for a unsafe uh, kind of otitis media. And uh, yes, the mucopurulent one, and which usually responds to treatment, is a safe one. Thank you. Thank you for I'm your for, Sorry, I'm sorry. Just, just continue. Uh, your uh, unsafe ear is not going to respond to your medical line of treatment. So the uh, ear will keep on discharging despite of antibiotics and ear drops. So any ear which is uh, having uh, not having mucoid discharge or, or having muco, uh, mostly mucopurulent discharge and which is not responding to antibiotic treatment, we should refer to ENT for unsafe ear conditions. I think so. Yes. Now we will move uh, to notes conditions. Epistaxis. Epistaxis is a very common occurrence in pediatrics. Every now and then we see these uh, kids with epistaxis. Most of the time uh, parents get horrified to see epistaxis. But if it becomes recurrent, they also become reluctant to show. Therefore, we should find a good balance between that. Uh, what a pediatrician should do when to refer to ENT. Uh, sir Desai, sir, please. Well, um, recurrent small amount of epistaxis is a very, very common thing uh, for children. 
and most of the time times is not uh, it's not you know see uh, serious condition but the problem is uh, look of blood always um, causes concern to the parents they are not very happy to see blood coming out uh, so when they come for uh, um, to you for minor epistaxis you know the uh, primary treatment which you can always tell of pinching the nose pinch the nose put some ice on the girl and from most of the times parents also know this and if the blood stops and uh, it comes with cold or many children are nose pickers so if that is happening then it's something which can be stalled for a long time most of the times it will go away by itself uh, you know most of these bleeds come from the little area which is the anterior inferior part of the septum where whenever you try to touch the nose you will touch that area so it's a common thing in childhood and nothing to be worried about so i always tell the patients parents that look there is 3 to 4 liters of blood in the body so this much blood loss is not going to cause any problem um when the bleeding becomes uh, resistant it doesn't stop then you have to and then it is of course not because of these conditions if the bleeding keeps on becoming recurrent and doesn't stop with simple treatments or stops and comes up again and again then yes they need a reference because it was beyond the uh, management uh, was beyond uh, opd practice of a primary care physician but then when it becomes more than that then uh, naturally it should be referred there are certain conditions where the bleeding is severe like it doesn't just doesn't stop and then obviously the patient has to be uh, admitted packing has to be done and other things have to be done so then there are the causes are different sometimes it can be a ble bleeding disorder which you know better uh, about that than us and all the um, bleeding parameters checking etc etc and even if you send it to me i will send it to pediatrician to do all the parameters so that uh, that is another thing there are certain conditions like tumors of the nose one one of which i would try to uh, like to highlight on is called as an angiofibroma where the bleeding is torrential and obviously then we don't need to tell you to refer the child will automatically get referred and uh, then you know you do uh, as i said the blood parameters first and of course uh, image and on the imaging it will always throw light what condition it is and then from there onwards uh, now we have for angiofibromas we are all doing endoscopic excision so it has not remained such a big uh, morbid surgery like it used to be this is about one condition there are multiple other conditions but i i feel the um, take home message would be uh, if the bleeding does not stop with the standard medical treatment sometimes i mean you can even do a chemical cautery for that little seria ulcer in your opd it's no big deal that can be done and you can stop the uh, bleeding forever but if it goes beyond that then obviously it has to be <clears throat> i don't think for a bad epistaxis we need to tell somebody to refer you automatically <laughs> yes yes thank you sir uh, even after uh, doing all packing and that the recurrent bleeding is there then again pediatrician has to investigate for bleeding disorders and other things uh, yeah regarding next issue uh, nasal foreign body uh, should pediatrician manage this as far as possible or directly refer to the ENT specialist Abhijit. Uh, obviously, I would say it's better to uh, refer it to a ENT specialist, and uh, because the kind of instrumentation we have, the kind of uh, light we can put into the nose when we are removing the foreign body, okay, that I think probably is not available with a pediatrician in your setup. Keeping both the hands free would not be possible unless you have a headlamp. So these are basic things that you would need uh, when you are removing a foreign body. So I think it would be advisable to let the ENT surgeon manage this. Even if foreign body is seen at the just external layers or near the external layers, should we interfere or should not we? We should not. Probably, if no one interferes, the foreign body is going to come out once the child sneezes. If it's going, to, it's so superficial. <laughs> so okay, but usually parents are panic panicky. Yeah. They want us something to do. And if it is uh, reachable within uh, our small instruments, which I don't know, have. you know, you might sometimes end up pushing the foreign body further yeah. inside and make it difficult to be removed. So probably uh, giving uh, someone who is uh, accustomed to use the instruments and removing the foreign body should be involved. Yes, yes. 
Thank you. Uh, also, the child's going to give you just one attempt at removing it because the second attempt is going to involve anesthesia. So if it's going to be just one attempt uh, in a child who's already very apprehensive, the parents are apprehensive, then let that attempt be done by someone who has maybe a higher degree of success. The second time, no child's going to lie down there. And that's yes. going to be the challenge when you then subsequently send the patient to an ENT because the child now is scared. And then, you know, we, are, we unfortunately will have to then say, okay, now it's going to involve a general anesthesia. Okay. Thank you, madam. One thing which I would like to tell about foreign body, red, red, reddest flag. Is for God's sake, don't use a force. Don't use? So for sitting around okay. the foreign body inside. So foreign bodies need to be removed by hooking them out. You try to use a first it is going to be mistake. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question in uh, for the nose uh, region is noisy breathing. It's a very common complaint in all pediatric age group from infancy almost to the uh, big kids also. Usually they have noisy breathing. According to age, what is the management? Wait, madam, please. Okay, so if you're starting from infancy, um, that means uh, in a neonatal and I'm having noisy breathing, obviously the first thing that we are looking at would be laryngomalacia. Uh, you know, is that something which is of concern? Uh, in which case between the neonatologist and the pediatrician and me, we usually do come to a diagnosis. You will see that the child is better in a prone position. Uh, very rarely uh, do you really have to intervene in a very active way in laryngomalacia, but that's again um, a topic which is different. Uh, in a slightly older kid, which would be maybe an infant or a toddler, the cause of noisy breathing could just be a plain and simple URTI. It could also be uh, a foreign body lying in the nose or anything which is obstructing the nose. Uh, really would not get very, very upset about it. So a lot of history taking here would be important. There are the parents just getting upset about the fact that the child is breathing uh, as in they can hear the sound or is the child really getting disturbed during sleep? So is the child like, you know, getting up with some sort of a choking episode and gasping for air? So that's a history that I would really ask uh, the parent. Uh, also, you know, is the breathing the same throughout the day? Does it get exacerbated more at night? Because if it's something which is exacerbated more at night, then you're looking at different conditions. So does the position of the child in any way alter uh, the way the child is uh, breathing? Uh, in older kids, of course, uh, it could be a DNS. It could be anything in the nose uh, as in a local pathology that could be causing noisy breathing. But in my practice, I think the people who really complain to us about noisy breathing are parents who have... Um, We've just got a baby. They're very, very apprehensive. You know, they, they feel ki, um, thoda zyada aara hai, you know, and you'll, usually they'll come in with the grandmother and there'll be a whole lot of uh, people there. And what you just see is there's just secretions there. So a lot of reassurance, giving them saline nasal drops, humidifying the baby uh, usually helps. Um, of course, if the reference comes from an NICU, then it's different. Then I know I'm looking at maybe a laryngomalacia or a coanal atresia. Those, those would be different. But by and large, it's it's more just very, very apprehensive uh, parents and just nasal discharge. Most of the time, parents come to us at cubs halai, mulala cubs halai. Actually, this is a most of the time noisy breathing just because of nasal blockage or as you told, all these conditions. And most of the time, we have to reassure that the cup halela nahi hai, kahi nahi hai. Actually, cup, this word is used slow, so widely. Everybody, everybody in the, especially grandfathers, uh, grandmothers tell that mulala cup jala hai, tasa cup pahila bhair kaan. Hey, usually, we have to reassure them there is nothing like cup. And this is just noisy breathing. Thank you, madam. Uh, now, the next question, uh, CSF rhinorrhea. Usually, the CSF leak either after head injury or any, mostly like after head injury, through nose or through ear, the CSF leaks, when we should suspect it, how to confirm it, and what are the treatment options? Uh, sir, they say, sir. Traumatic CSF leaks are not very difficult to diagnose because you know that there is a trauma and watering water, clear water coming out of nose. <clears throat> Most of the times these will, um, they are self-limiting. 
uh, by basic uh, management like head up and if required something like manage all the it's all the problem um the real problem is spontaneous incident and they are very often missed because the nasal discharges which come uh, many times are interpreted as allergic rhinitis and only when the child gets a meningitis that time only uh, is this is suspected i have had a couple of pediatric csa clinic patients uh, i have sent a video if you can show it i don't know whether it opens or not but a pediatric csa clinic patient um, should not be should not be um, brought to us after few attacks of meningitis because a recurrent recurrent meningitis is a thing which will happen in a spontaneous csa leak and unfortunately whenever we have operated on such patients they have come after a few attacks of meningitis um, it means that the primary csa leak was missed uh, watering unilateral watery discharge should be clarified um, confirmed uh, and uh, unless otherwise proven should be considered as csa leak and there is a test called beta 2 transparent test you can collect the fluid and send it for that test which will confirm whether it is cs or not so if the child is having unilateral watery discharge over a long time then uh, it should be suspected as csf this is again another take home message which can be taken that if there is a unilateral um, watery leak from uh, from the nose then uh, please do not be please be aware that it can be csf and if it is a spontaneous leak it needs to be closed and there is a excellent way of doing it by an endoscope endoscopic transnasal csf leak closure is a very very established thing now then uh, that should be done thank you sir most of the time it stops spontaneously or we should intervene a traumatic will stop most of the times spontaneous will not okay yeah the next question uh... We'll uh, just uh, a comment about CSF leak, as Dr. Ravi rightfully said, uh, recurrent meningitis is your first pointer towards it. But most importantly, most of these kids have uh, associated inner ear anomalies, and they actually present to us with a CSF leak from the nose, but the pathology actually lies uh, in the ear. Uh, we've had quite a big series of this in KEM now. And that's why whenever you're screening any child with recurrent meningitis, um, as Dr. Ravi will also agree with me, we don't only screen them for a potential leak in the nose, but they also have to be screened for both the ears because it may be trickling from the ear through the eustachian tube and actually the child is dripping uh, in the nose. So in children, especially, this is very, very common. So recurrent meningitis, always look at uh, the year also as a focus. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. For and your CSA photorhinoria? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, very correctly said. That. Yeah. Now we'll move to, sir, throat and mouth questions. Uh, most of the time, our parents come with that okay, tonsils are there. He's not growing. Remove tonsils and he will grow. This is actually this is a slightly older uh, phenomena, but still, you can just throw a light on this topic: growth of growth and tonsils, myth and facts, myths and facts. Sir, they say, sir. I think our generation lost tonsils in this hope that the child will grow. <laughs> <laughs> See, the point is, you can understand that tonsillectomy is done at the age of around five, six, seven. And the growth spurt comes after that. The natural growth spurt comes after that. So, as I said, for full generations, growth credit was unnecessarily given to tonsils. But uh, I, I submit there is no sense in that. Unless, you know, like a child who is falling sick very often because of tonsillitis. And after tonsillectomy, he starts eating that, etc. I think most of the times it is the coincidence, coinciding of the growth spurt after the tonsillitis. Okay. Chronic tonsillitis may cause his uh, energy diverted to this uh, treating this infection or handling this infection. This was the initial uh, what the people or what the doctors might say. But uh, yeah, I would just like to add there, Lalit, yes, that, yes, yes. Uh, yes, chronic tonsillitis does affect the child's growth and uh, not only physical but mental growth also. Because every episode of infection, the child's growth is going to get stunted. 
And uh, pediatricians, US pediatricians must have noticed that any child who is chronically ill, not only for the tonsils, but any other condition also, the growth is going to get stunted. Yes. So yes, in these patients who have do have chronic tonsillitis, uh, surgery is definitely going to help them grow and uh, thrive better. But uh, for a healthy individual, if you remove the tonsils, no, it's not going to help at all. Okay. The next so question is... So the yeah, one Madam. common reference again is uh, from the pediatricians is they look at the throat and they say tonsil muthe zale zaun kaadun gya. So it's not only the growth, I think, please remember that the size also doesn't really make a difference. It has to be, it can be a small tonsil, but it can be one which is, Some as Abhijit yeah. said, getting infected. Uh, or it could be a perfectly big tonsil, but it's not giving any issues to the child. So it's not the size that matters. It's what that organ is doing to the child that's more important. Even if we see kissing tonsils, sometimes we should not we are eager to remove it. We should treat it first if there is tonsillitis, acute tonsillitis. We should uh, come out from acute condition and then we should take an ENT referral to decide is it chronic or not and then we should go. I think this is the message you want to give. The next question is CLEP management. CLEP palate. The CLEP palate management, how it should be handled, when it should be operated. Associated CLEP lift is there, it's okay. But for the CLEP palate, when they uh, these kids should be operated madam please throw light i'm sorry dr doka but i don't do the surgery um it's referred um, by force at km to the uh, plastic department so i would not be the right person to answer this question because i don't handle cleft palates it's handled completely by the plastic uh, department at our uh, hospital but usually when the child uh, is detected right when they bring them or when the child is delivered, then the reference goes immediately and they are the ones who decide the timeline. Uh, according to ENT point of view, uh, what is your opinion? It should be done as soon as possible because this is the one, uh, they, it again depends on whether this is really affecting the feeding of the child or the thriving of the child. The cleft lip is the one that's more uh, of an issue. Uh, from the point of view of sucking and from the point of view of uh, breastfeeding. Uh, the cleft palate sometimes, you know, if the child doesn't have an associated cleft lip and it's just the palatal issue, uh, but not really affecting the feeding or that the child is getting any episodes of nasal regurgitation, etc., then this can be delayed. Uh, but like I said, I personally don't uh, handle this. Sir, they say, sir. No, as Nidam rightly said, I don't think anti surgeons in the no, they don't. Cleft palate or cleft lip at all. And as she said, I mean, it should be done as early as possible because of the feeding issue. Second uh, important thing about cleft palate is that cleft palate would cause uh, eustachian tube infections more mm -hmm. through the mouth. So that is another thing which comes to my mind, although I really don't uh, deal with it. So I'm not the right person to answer this. Abhijit, do you want to? No, 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 no. no. Okay. No, I don't. I don't think any uh, ENT surgeon is doing uh, left lip or left palate surgery at present. Okay. Uh, next issue is speech issues. Madam has elaborately told about uh, hearing and speech, but some other uh, issues like hyponasal speech, hypernasal speech, and tongue tie. What is your opinion, uh, Abhijit? Okay, so uh, typically a uh, hyponasal speech would be uh, when you have a nasal obstruction. So uh, the presence of adenoids or polyps or uh, a deviated nasal septum and large turbinates causing nasal obstruction can give rise to a hyponasal voice where the uh, uh, probably just treating acute causes would just take care of this uh, hyponasal voice. And if it is persistent, yes, it's worthwhile going into the uh, nose, having a look where the obstruction lies and treating it. Hypernasal voice would be where the air escapes from the uh, nasopharynx, I mean, from the oropharynx into the nasopharynx while speaking. And uh, it could be a sh short palate or, uh, or just post-surgery uh, where we see uh, after adenoidectomy, uh, where the... Uh, patient ends up with a hypernasal voice and eventually I think they do settle down and the voice comes back to normal. About a tongue tie, I think there's a lot of hype about uh, tongue ties and I really know, uh, wonder whether they should be 
uh, treated. So unless uh, it's a significant tongue, tongue tie and the tongue cannot be move, moved around in the mouth itself, uh, I think there's no need for surgery. Usually some speech therapists tell that because of tongue tie, your child is not developing a good speech and they suggest to uh, do the surgery of tongue tie. Yes, How, if it is not, yeah, so if the tongue is not reaching the arch of the palate, okay, uh, that would be a condition where you would not be able to speak because of the tongue tie, uh, uh, pronounce properly because of the tongue tie. And uh, one more thing, one interesting thing, uh, one, one of my dentists told me that your tongue has to be moving around in the mouth to keep your teeth clean, especially after feeds and all. So if your tongue is not moving around and if you cannot clean all your teeth with your uh, tongue, you will land up with frequent dental infections. So yes, that could be an indication where you would be, uh, you would want to release the tongue. And, yeah, As a ENT <laughs> specialist, you usually look in mouth, how frequently you see association of tongue tie with dental caries? <laughs> Uh, I have not really looked into that. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I have no, no experience. Yeah, because you have, you just have uh, raised that point. Yeah, that moment of that is what I discussed with my dentist. So that is where he pointed out that yes, probably. Uh, previously, more. nasolalia apalta and nasolalia aperta. I think these are the same as hyponasal or hypernasal. Yeah. 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 I think the take-home message here is that they basically have to be evaluated by a speech therapist. I mean, once, as Abhijit rightfully said, we ruled out that there is no ENT cause like adenoids, etc., everything. For hypernasality, most of these kids have what we call a VPI, that's a varopharyngeal um, incompetence. Uh, most of them uh, have to take uh, speech therapy. So I think it's, it's not just us as ENT surgeons who are handling this patient. It has to be with a speech or a voice therapist. And most of the tongue ties also, sometimes the parent brings the child saying, Ji, purna bahar nigat nahi hai, please operate. And I always say, first get me a reference from a speech therapist who will look at articulation because the, the role of that tongue is mainly in producing certain, uh, certain phenoms. And only if the speech therapist is telling us that there are articulation issues related to the movement of the tongue, would a tongue tie surgery be done? And a dictum usually is that if you protrude the tongue and it crosses the lower lip border, you don't need the surgery. That means articulation won't get hampered. Okay. Thank and you, madam, giving us an objective not, criteria. Not forget palatal paralysis anyway. Some neurological condition causing palatal paralysis. Great. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we'll move to the next. Uh, some questions on throat and mouth also. This is a laryngomalacia. Uh, Madam has discussed this thing, but uh, still, when conservative weight and watch should be abandoned? This is a specific question. Usually, laryngomalacia do not require any intervention, but there are some conditions when we should intervene. Madam, please elaborate. Failure to thrive. I mean, uh, you'll get the reference from the neurologist saying that this child is just not breathing well. They have a lot of sternal um, retraction. Uh, the uh, they are requiring intubation. The PO2 levels are really dropping drastically down. Uh, so it's going to be as a reference which comes as failure to thrive. I'm not going to wait and watch in that particular case because remember that the child is going to get tired. At some point, if the child is constantly using his accessory muscles of breathing, that's the sternum and the neck, et cetera, there's fatigue that sets in and then they just don't breathe. So wait and watch uh, will not be used for children who are uh, using a lot of accessory muscles of respiration. They're getting fatigued. You're having the PO2 levels drop uh, drastically down. Uh, and when you put in the scope, you're seeing that the entire larynx is getting indrawn. Then you have to go in and do something. Yes, madam. We see in neonatal ICU, some kids who require intubation for this laryngomalacia and uh, drop in saturation. If we keep intubated, they will maintain, but what, sorry, what type of intervention you do in such cases where the they are not maintaining saturation or they're not maintaining the patency of larynx or trachea? So we assess the larynx. Uh, what we do is we ship the patient to the OT and uh, we just take the patient under gaseous anesthesia. We do not paralyze the patient. Um, then the tube is removed. And then during respiration, we watch what's happening to the um, to the suprastructure of the larynx when the child is breathing. 
depending on what's happening, you can plan a surgery. So if we are seeing that the larynx or the epiglottis is completely folded and falling into it, then there's something called an epito epiglottocopexy. We've done it for only two children till now, uh, where you kind of trim the epiglottis and you suture it to the base of the tongue. Um, so we've done this for two children and they've benefited. Sometimes you're also seeing a lot of accessory uh, mucosa along the area epiglottic fold and you actually do a, a trimming of it. So with a, with a laser, you kind of trim it. Uh, that we've only done in one patient. But uh, by and large, it would be as, uh, you know, experience is wait and watch. But there are some patients, depending on what is obstructing, that you have to uh, do a surgical procedure. Um, I think lately we've um, had two or three kids. We just couldn't even wait. And I think uh, one of my colleagues has had to do a tracheostomy for two of them, which is something uh, you really don't want in a neonate. But as far as possible, uh, these procedures can help. Yeah, even after operative, uh, there might be swelling. You need sometimes this uh, yes. tracheostomy yes. So during it's, it's obviously It's not obviously something where I'm just going to do the procedure and the kid's going to all go off the tube. So what will happen is, let's say the child had a three number. I'm just taking a number, a three number um, endotracheal tube. Uh, we'll do the procedure. He'll maybe go on to a two number, but he will be on steroids. So the child will be on both systemic and nebulizing steroids that will go on. And then we'll gradually get him off uh, the tube. So he'll shift onto a BiPAP and then slowly, slowly wean him off. It's not that you do the procedure and the tube is out. No, it's it's a gradual process in weaning them off. Yeah. Sometimes we see, even after prolonged ventilate, ventilation in new units, we see that kids after removing tube are not maintaining saturation. Similar conditions. I, I feel, Mr. Uh, Dr. Doka, the problem that's happening is... Uh, this is just my personal experience that when you are taking off children of prolonged intubation, you have to do it very, very slowly. So a step down on the tubes, make sure that they are adequately under steroid cover, uh, shift them uh, you know, onto a BiPAP and just do it very slowly. This thing about just remove the tube and expect the child is going to believe is not going to happen. They invariably have a lot of subglottic edema. And every time that he's trying to breathe in, in that subglottic edema, due to the Bernoulli's principle, you're causing more edema. So it's it's really a very, very slow you know, uh, process. So it's not something that will even happen in 24 hours. If you're planning now an extubation uh, in the hospital, we are going to say it's going to take you about three to four days of a slow planned step down. Yes. Thank you, madam. Thank you for inputs. Uh, now, Sir Desai, sir. Can you throw light on uncommon diseases of ENT airways? How to pick them up and when yeah. we should refer to it? One of them is this. Laryngomalacia is quite common, but the severe variety of laryngomalacia is not very common. And what I would say about laryngomalacia is that if the child needs intubation, then the larynx needs to be looked. Or if the child, basic uh, difference between a laryngomalacia, benign laryngomalacia, and a severe laryngomalacia is the child suffers spells of cyanosis, oxygen saturation, dips down. And then there is a surgery called supraglottopexy, where you cut the epiglottic fluids with laser and a partial epiglottectomy, as even described. is fairly successful, although you have to follow all the rules of child airway care, like going on smaller tubes and bypass, etc. Et uh, what I feel about the... Um, airway diseases is that there is no harm in having a look at the larynx. Many times they are just managed uh, airway diseases with uh, many times they are misinterpreted as asthma or croup. Uh, whenever there is a hoarseness or whenever there is a stridor, there is no harm in having a look at the larynx. Nowadays with a simple laser endoscope and a larynx, your conventional laryngoscope, a wonderful view of the larynx is available. And we know what is the condition. So there is no point in just managing the child without having a look at the larynx. So laryngoscopy, um, see, as uh, it is always said that you do 10 laryngoscopies and one comes positive, and probably you are doing less number of laryngoscopies because you need to look at them more of more and more often so that you will diagnose them earlier. And the point is, in a child who has respiratory uh, compromise, 
then the uh, complications which are looking at are very severe and for life. So there is no harm in having a look and if there is a treatment possible that can reverse all the effects of chronic hypoxia and make the child's life better. So here are a few conditions. One is uh, the anomalisha and there is another condition where hoarseness is many times not really looked at, thought to be because of upper respiratory infections, etc. Et but hoarseness has certain conditions which are very severe. Here is the second picture is showing laryngeal papillomas. Now, laryngeal papilloma, juvenile laryngeal, laryngeal papilloma is a condition uh, which is very, very morbid, extremely recurrent because they are called as recurrent juvenile laryngeal papilloma. And the earlier it is diagnosed, because most of the times in government hospital, when I was honorary in Susun, we used to see these patients when they used to come for tracheostomy, completely obstructed. And tracheostomy is a very, very morbid thing in uh, juvenile laryngeal papillomas and it also encourages a simple laryngeal papilloma to convert itself into a recurrent respiratory laryngeal uh, uh, respiratory papillomas where the papillomas can spread into the trachea and the uh, bronchi and uh, most of the times that can be fit. So a poor child, if he is given a chance to get his larynx examined, these conditions can be diagnosed. Uh, the third condition which I want your attention to be on is what is called as a bilateral abductor palsy. And here you see that this is the larynx in adduction and this is the larynx in abduction. You must understand that uh, inspiration is a function of abduction where the vocal cords move away and uh, phonation is a function of adduction. And there is a general perception that a vocal cord problem will always present with change in voice. It doesn't happen in this condition because the child would go into repeated attacks of stridors. But in spite of that, he may have a completely normal voice because the paralysis is of abduction and not adduction. So this condition many times is missed and the child is again brought to brought at the time when he's completely obstructed and he needs a tracheostomy. Sometimes this condition gets spontaneous recovery within six months. But diagnosis is very important. So you must be aware of this condition. Then there is a condition where the child would have a laryngeal stridor, would have complete respiratory problem without having a change in this. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving these such nice pictures mm -hmm. and explaining about these airway problems. <clears throat> no, sir, you can have some questions in question answer box and chat box also. Yeah, yeah. Just two, three questions. After that, we'll take question. Uh, congenital disorders of ear, how to handle them, when to act, and what are the cosmetic angles? Wait, madam, please. Uh, as far as congenital disorders of the ear, it all depends on whether it's unilateral or bilateral. That's going to decide what I'm going to do. Uh, if it's unilateral, I'm not worried. Uh, the first thing that I need to reassure the parents is that is the hearing normal. So usually the child or the parent will come to me just a couple of weeks after delivery. They're very worried that there is this one ear which is malformed. At which stage you just get a hearing evaluation done more to convince the parents that the other ear is completely normal. If the other ear is completely normal, then as far as development of speech, language and all other milestones are concerned, nothing to be done. And you reassure them to that point. Uh, the cosmetic angle is what troubles them the most. They are more worried about how it's going to look, at which time you have to tell them that the child now is just an infant and whatever the year that we are going to develop, we are going to do it when the child is at least eight to 10 years of age. If you're looking at surgery, which involves using the rib cartilage, then the ribs uh, enough for me to harvest cartilage would be when the child's chest is about that of a 10 year, giving that his nutrition and everything is normal. Uh, there are now, of course, processes available, which are also fixed with titanium screws, but all that when the child is much older. So that's what we would do for a unilateral. With a bilateral, we are more worried because now we know that the hearing is down to a point where the speech and language skills will not develop. So again, a hearing assessment is done. At this time, the hearing assessment that has done is very important that you refer the patient to a center which does both air conduction and bone conduction better. Because if the child doesn't have the pinna, then the air conduction better is going to show you nothing. It's going to show you a profound loss. Whereas it's the bone conduction better that's going to tell us that does the child have adequate hearing in the inner ear. 
So if in the bone conduction bearer, we are able to see that the child's inner ears are well developed, then you're going to fit this child with what we call a bone conduction hearing device. It could be a soft band. It could just be something that they wear like this, whereby they hear with the mastoid. That fitting will happen immediately. For that, I'm not going to wait till the child gets open. Again, the cosmetic issues will again be the same counseling that you will address that when the child is much older. For a bilateral, I will insist on imaging by the time the child is about two years of age, where we are requiring a score, which is called the just of a score. That score basically gives me an idea whether as a surgeon, we can do anything to repair the hearing of this child or whether we are going to look at giving this child an assistive listening device. So that decision will be made only on imaging. I hope that summarizes it. Uh, now, Abhijit, please uh, help us in uh, vaccine ear. Usually, most of the parents uh, put oil in the ear. The vaccine is swollen. And they come that this vaccine, there is a large amount of wax in the ear. You remove it. Or should we go to ENT for removing it? Actually, what should be the policy for vaccine ear by a pediatrician? Please. A lot of, sorry. So a lot of people do have a vaccine. Having wax is an actual phenomenon in the ear and it normally comes out on its own. So with every jaw movement, the wax is being pushed out. And uh, all you need to do is uh, clean your ears probably when you take a bath with just a finger uh, outside the canal, ear canal. And uh, a lot of uh, children, we do see wax in the ear, but unless there are, there are any symptoms, I wouldn't recommend removing the wax. So unless the child has sort of hearing loss or uh, pain because of the wax, uh, I don't think we should be uh, intervening. Wax removal uh, can be done in, I think even a, uh, in your pediatric OPD, you could probably do uh, uh, wax removal, uh, try uh, syringing. It's a uh, significantly easy procedure and uh, can be done. But uh, in a painful year, it's better not to uh, try syringing uh, by a pediatrician. Thank you, Abhijit, for your inputs. Uh, as we all know, meningitis has a dreaded, uh, is a dreadful complication in pediatrics, uh, usually in neonatology. Uh, we see a lot of meningitis cases, and it does have hearing effect. Madam has uh, elaborated on in her lecture regarding meningitis and hearing deafness. Can you throw some more light on meningitis and hearing? Um, wait, madam. Uh, yeah, Dr. Doka, could I have the slides I shared with yes, you for yes, this, sir. please? We'll have. Uh, so I, I always uh, would like to talk at least two minutes on meningitis to a crowd which is predominantly pediatrician because we really don't realize this, but it is today the most leading cause of postnatal deafness and it accounts for almost 9% of childhood deafness. It's also the most frequent long-term complication of meningitis. So if you were to watch 40% of survivors of meningitis, both adult and children, you would realize that they do have some amount of uh, hearing loss. Uh, the worst thing about this is that about 4% of them will develop a, a profound hearing loss, uh, one that you know almost no device is going to be able to help them with. So that's why it's very important that the pediatrician is fully aware about which are the patients in whom the chances of hearing loss are much higher. If your patient has a history of developing seizures, if the duration of hospitalization for that particular attack is more than seven days, if the patient has a concurrent cranial nerve neuropathy and the CSF proteins are very, very high, but the most important thing was that if the the CSF glucose was very low. That is the most consistent predictor of the fact that these patients are going to have uh, hearing loss, which is associated with meningitis. When we look at the organism that's causing it mostly, it's streptococcus pneumoniae. It's not hemophilus influenza, as was commonly thought. Also, those patients who reach a hospital more than 48 hours after they develop the signs of meningitis, are the ones uh, who have a more highly likely uh, hold of getting um, hearing loss. 
So if your patient has any of these pointers, these are the ones you need to counsel the parents and make it a point that you advise them to undergo um, a screening. The reason why we say this is because when they develop meningitis, they develop a very bad issue in what we call the cochlea on the inner ear. The entire cochlear lumen gets completely obstructed with initially fibrous tissue and later on dense bone. Once the bone forms inside the cochlea, then we cannot even offer the alternative of cochlear implantation to these patients. And the onset happens very fast. Literature has reported that the onset can happen as early as two weeks after meningitis. And I'm so happy that at KEM, we were able to diagnose this thanks to our pediatricians being so aware about this. We diagnosed a patient within three weeks of meningitis. Imaging showed that there was fibrosis happening. Implant was put in within a month of meningitis. And we were able to save that kid's hearing. So this is very important that you pick it up. This is just for your information. This is a normal scan, which is showing you a normal basal uh, uh, lumen where the uh, arrow is. Can I have the next? Yeah. And this is what has happened. Post meningitis, that entire cochlea is covered by dense white bone. It's called a whiteout. I can't see anything inside. That's it. No options for this child now other than maybe going in for an auditory brainstem implant, which costs almost triple of what a cochlear implant costs and is available only in two centers in India, or send him to a uh, special school. So if this child had got diagnosed earlier, we could have salvaged this child's hearing. The other question that we get very commonly from the pediatricians is, is this hearing loss reversible? Most people say, no, let's wait, we'll keep a follow-up. If the child has severe to profound hearing loss when initially evaluated after meningitis, that hearing loss is never going to reverse. The hearing loss that reverses is if it's very, very mild. And in those cases, you have to give them steroids under the cover of antibiotics and you're able to reverse it. But if the hearing loss is already um, severe or profound, that's irreversible. Next, please. So, the steroids is one where we again have a lot of debate. The pediatrician is worried, this kid has got meningitis, I'm giving this patient antibiotics, he's immunocompromised. If I give him steroids, you know, will something go wrong? And that's what we've got to realize that it's like a balance, your kid's got antibiotic cover. If you give them steroids, it really helps to reduce both the hearing loss and the neurologic sequelae. So it should be administered in conjunction with the antibiotics. And we have enough in the literature that says this. So to all pediatricians, if you have cases of meningitis, especially with those pointers that I mentioned before, uh, please consider using steroids in conjunction with antibiotics to prevent these uh, losses. I think that's it, Dr. Luka. Regarding the questions in the question answer box, we have received Okay. Any questions? As in the chat box, the question answer box had one, which I actually, while I was waiting, I've answered. But the chat box has uh, a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. As a clinician, I would like to know why is there a discharge? So I would refer oh, no, to that Dr. was the, sorry, Dr. Doka. I answered that question to yeah, Dr. Yeah. Halbe. She had asked a question in the beginning saying, how long do we wait uh, till a patient has discharged through her year? Um, so I just answered that question to her that, you know, why do you want to wait? Don't you want to know why the discharge is there? So refer it. Uh, she has then yeah. asked a question up also. It's a little higher up. She's yeah. asked three questions. Current epistaxis investigations. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Abhijit has, has already asked, covered. Uh, yeah, she asked the wax and she asked the uh, role of saline nasal drops in noisy breathing. She asked yeah. three questions. And what are the basic investigation in the recurrent epitaxis? She has asked. Yes, sir. Sir, they say, sir. Can you repeat the question? Investigations related to epistaxis. I think a good ENT checkup 
ियोस्कोपी and now we often do it with a endoscope and endoscopic examination whatever it indicates accordingly we'll go ahead about imaging basically imaging and then various types of imaging like you do a x ray or a ct scan mri angiography digital subtraction angiography depending upon it there is a clinic so these are the investigations which would cover most of the causes yeah one more question is there can hypertrophy of adenoids cause laryngeal stridor Mm. Abhijit. I think you please unmute Abhijit please unmute unmute yourself. Yeah. No I don't know I uh, I don't think uh, adenoids can cause the laryngeal stridor. No. Yeah adenoids is a slow growing thing so over time as the adenoids grow child automatically develops then small thing no question of laryngeal stridor. okay i think regarding ent almost all questions has, has been covered any other questions from anyone i think ent panel discussion has been elaborate and everybody <laughs> is very much enlightened after uh, all you three stalwarts has uh, given the very good inputs very good discussion i will hand over mic to mude sir thank you deepak mude sir yeah 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 stop sharing uh, yeah yeah okay thank you all the panelists thank you dhoka sir you have very nicely moderated the session and thank you all the uh, stalwarts of ent you have explained everything in very detail and very simplified manner which are very useful in our day to day practice thank you very much thanks i also thank, thank dr sushruta ma'am also and of time logist stalwarts all who have taken their sessions excellently i also thank dr ujwala mudgirika ma'am who had conducted this uh, uh, cme very nicely thank you all the delegates thank you dr parag and iap team and thank you dig shield for supporting this thank you sheetal our office staff without her it is impossible i thank you all of you and i declare this the end of session thank you very much Oh uh, hello hello